of day two. Uh, now I would like to invite Dr. Vaigra Lakshmi Nayak ma'am uh, to start our session with her introduction. Ma'am? Yeah. Ma ma audible? So, uh, yeah, yeah. I think uh, I don't need any introduction because I was already there also yesterday. So uh, I welcome all of you to this uh, day two session. I think it will be more interesting than the yesterday's session. We have stalwarts here with us and there will be many video presentations. So I think we'll have a lot to learn today. So thank you so much for joining and making this activity a very lively activity for the Northeast. But I think all are welcome. Everyone can join this. So at the outset, I would uh, request uh, Dr. Um, Pinaki to introduce uh, Dr. Yogesh to us. Okay. Uh, Dr. Yogesh Verma, sir, uh, welcome to today's session. Uh, Dr. Yogesh Verma, sir, is an MD, is currently, uh, currently working as the medical superintendent of the Central Referral Hospital and professor with the Sikkim Manipal Institute of Medical Sciences at Gangtok. He was working with the government of Sikkim in the Department of Health in various positions and retired as the principal chief consultant and medical superintendent of the Sir Thurtop uh, Nainggyal Memorial Hospital in Gangtok. Trained as a pathologist from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, he was instrumental in establishing laboratory services in the state of Sikkim. He was the principal investigator for the population-based uh, cancer registry for Sikkim and also a number of Indian Council of Medical Research ICMR funded projects. He has been closely associated with the randomized trial of two versus three dose HPV vaccination under International Agency for Research on Cancer, IARC, and continues to work with the extended follow-up of the participant. He is also a member of various institutional ethics committee in the state and was member of the state technical advisory group for rollout of HPV vaccination in the state of Sikkim. He has also presented papers in number of international conferences and has large number of he has contributed to the national report of national cancer registry program since 2003 and to the cancer incidents in the five continents. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. And Sikkim. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pinaki. Welcome, sir. sir. Okay. So, should I start? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, upload. Karo. Hmm. Okay, yeah. So, can you see it now? No, no. Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can see okay. this. There is a lot of. Eco, Please make it full screen. I think if everybody mutes themselves, then probably yeah. that eco will not be there. And please uh, make it full screen, sir. Uh, please tell your assistant okay. to make it full screen. Full screen. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Perfect. Hello. Now, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, I, uh, I wanted to speak about HPV vaccination guidelines and the second model. Now, if you remember, Sikkim is the only state in, in, in India which has introduced HPV vaccination in the entire state. This was done in the year 2019, 1819, uh, where the uh, cohort of uh, uh, girls between the age of 9 to 14 were given this vaccination. But to reach that stage, it was not an easy, it was not easy. So actually I began this work, although I never began it with the intention of starting HPV vaccination, but you know, it somehow it led from one place to another, one stage to another. And then finally it led to this situation where we could, where we could introduce HPV vaccination in the state. 
So first of all, we needed was the information as to how much of cancer burden is there in our state. So we first began with the participation in the Cancer Atlas program in 2001. In 2003, we established the population-based cancer registry under the National Cancer Registry Program, ICMR. And then we also had certain publications in which a comparative profile and prevalence and age distribution of HPV virus 1618 among three states of India with focus on Northeast India was published in the International Journal of Gynae Cancer in 2007. So, you know, we had a subset. We came to know that you know, what was the type of infection which was there in, in the state of Sikkim. Then we began with the randomized trial of two versus three dose of HP vaccination under International Agency for Research on Cancer in 2009. Based on all these, we had this, you know, we came to, uh, because of the data we had in the cancer registry and also from the Cancer Atlas program, we came to know that the average age incidence rates for cancer of the cervix was 10.1 per 1 lakh population. And it was around in 2015, 11.52 to 2016, 9.41. So based on this, uh, I started thinking that, uh, you know, in fact, not me only, but uh, yes, I initiated the idea uh, to start a strategic plan for HPV vaccination in Sikkim. Why I wanted to do it in Sikkim, although our incident rates are not that high, but I still felt that one model state in India would be an ideal situation in which other states can also participate. So we started a strategic plan for HPV vaccination in Sikkim in October 2012. So which was a document, which was a document uh, and which was submitted to the government and in which had all the different aspects about HPV vaccination, like the background, rational for introducing of HPV vaccination in Sikkim, introducing why the quadrivalent HPV vaccination in Sikkim, and strategies for introducing quadrivalent HPV vaccine. That included monitoring, evaluation, and reporting, and sustainability of it. So this was a document which was prepared. And based on that, we forwarded to the government. What happened then was, that the government accepted it to a certain extent, and the first launch of the HPV vaccination was slated in the second week of January 2014. But unfortunately, since you know we had not done too much of, uh, you know, we had not motivated the people enough, the anti-vaccine groups within Sikkim and from the national level started a propaganda against the introduction of this vaccine. And at that point of time, there was the announcement of the general election and elections for the state of Sikkim in April 2014. Suddenly, the political priorities changed. HPV vaccine launch was postponed at the last moment. In fact, it was to be launched the next day and it was postponed on the, on the night before. The, and since it was a political decision, the executive also could not do anything. And we had to go with, a, with the political decision. So, I started believing that has HPV vaccination, is it in the, is a priority in the minds of the politicians? Anyway, the fight was on. Post-election, a committee was made to adopt strategies to be implement for prevention of cervical cancer was set up by the government of Sikkim. And also a letter was received from the government of India to the committee that we could go ahead with HPV vaccination on our own as health is a state subject. So once we had these two documents from the staff, from the committee, uh, we kept on continuing our work 
we started training the doctors and healthcare workers of DIA, in which Dr. Shankar and his team came to Sikkim. And you know, they took a number of a training programs, screen and treat approach with supply of equipment to the main hospital by IR was given. Advocacy meetings were conducted by Cancer Foundation of India for the decision makers and stakeholders. ICPO, NCI workshop, ASOCAM meetings, Research Triangle Institute meeting. So these were all various advocacy meetings which were attended by not only us, but by the executive also from this from the state of Sikkim. But there was no activity for the next two years. And the executive also was not certain about the political priorities of the government. So as HP vaccination was HP vaccination a priority in the mind of the politicians, we started wondering. And that is when suddenly the government announced that there would be the HPV vaccination, which would start in Sikkim between 30th July and 14th August 2018. So the message which I am trying to say is that you should not give up. You see, because the politicians have their own priorities at different stages. You see, so when they see that there's an optimum time, then they uh, take a decision. And that is what happened over here. So you'll be surprised. To, I was surprised to see this advertisement. By then, I had retired from the government, actually. And I was in Manipal. So I saw this advertisement uh, that the daughter is precious, protect her future with SP vaccine, age group 9 to 14, date 30th July to 14th August. And all venue was all government and public schools, STNM hospital, district hospital, primary health center. And this was an advertisement which came out. Now things had gone into the right perspective. So then discussions about health officials regarding HP vaccine introduction started. Stag committees were formed, state steering committee was formed, core groups were formed. Uh, then involvement, support from the partner agencies, WHO, UNICEF, meeting and discussions with HRDD and social decisions for target estimation. All this started taking place. Role of partners. WHO gave the technical support. UNICEF helped in the vaccine procurement. Japaigo supported in documentation of HPV vaccination campaign. And data collection and management, baseline survey of schools took place, line listing of all eligible girls was made. It was like a proper, you know, if you are if you have seen how this polio vaccination takes place, something like that. Tally sheets were made. Hmm. Uh, use of Miss Girl List format was made and daily submission of report from health sub center to primary health center to district hospital and then to the state level. And daily reporting of AEFI, meaning adverse event following immunization. Then, of course, uh, the target population for HPV vaccination campaign was HPV vaccine recommended for all 9 to 14 year old girls, two doses of vaccine separated by a minimum gap of six months. All schools included, government, semi-government, private, out-of-school girls of this age group were also covered. And total targeted girls was 25,284. That is the time it got introduced. So month one, this is the, uh, uh, you can see this picture, whose recommendation, minimum interval of six months, maximum interval of 12 to 14 months, 12 to 15 months. Okay. then. The HP vaccination campaign duration was two to three weeks. Initial one week vaccination in all schools, educational institutions. Second week in healthcare facilities was for dropout children. And vaccine was maintained in strict cold chain between two to eight degrees. Marking of, of left thumbnail with inedible marker pen, like we do it in the in the um, uh, voting. Uh, and vaccination certificates were provided to all vaccines. And the timing of the sessions were 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And concurrent monitoring for campaign quality and safety. So, IEC activities was, what had we done? Advocacy by political leaders in public meetings functions. 
the politicians play a very important role end of the day we may be technically sound but end of the day the people listen to them awareness generation during gram sabhas and any health program ic print and electronic social media miking during the campaign rallies by students and mosque church temple announcement so all these activities took place it's not an easy thing to do it's quite difficult but then it's a very fulfilling and what were the factors for this successful campaign strong political will and commitment i think i give this thing number 1 uh, uh, you know strength in this whole thing is strong political will and commitment good intersectorial coordination of course secure funding see, for sustainability dedicated and motivated workforce positive attitude of parents community at large good support from the print and electronic media school based approach followed by community based approach and 100% availability of trained ma power and afi kit during the vaccination session so these all can be done only with the support of the government as individuals or as small groups it is almost we can be advocates for the government but we know try to push it through but ultimately it has the government has to do it. challenges faced of course lot of negative social media post banking hassles were there problem in shipping of vaccine refusal by few schools and bulk vaccine storage problems but this were all taken care we have a limited population so we were able to take care of all that now if you look at the hpv coverage the first round i am not putting the uh, subsequent rounds but this first round if you look the total number of schools which participated was 1166 total number of schools in the sikkim are 1166 total number of schools which participated were 1123 number of girls in the 9 years to 14 years 2 2 lakhs 25284 those who got vaccinated were 24246 a percentage coverage of 96.69 in which only 13 vials were wasted second round we had a 97.85 coverage in which uh, almost everybody vaccine with the second dose 23922 uh, children came for the vaccination out of the 24446 so it was a huge success with a coverage of 97.85 in the second round and 96.69 in the first round so now of course it has been incorporated in the routine immunization for fresh 9 plus girls and unicef is facilitating the uh, vaccine procurement at gavi prices mode of hpv delivery will be at health facilities by annually and documentation of hpv is done in the mother and child protection card IC on HPV is continuing monitoring of long term AEFI following HPV vaccination and impact of HPV vaccination among the beneficiaries this is a project which i am already taking i am already doing it along with dr parker and all icmr so let's see what the outcomes are at a later stage so i would like to acknowledge of course the state immunization officer dr shankar dr parker Dr. Siddiqui, Sitaba Biswas, Government of Sikkim, UNICEF, WHO, and all individuals who finally made it happen. Thank you very much. I I hope you all could hear me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for the beautiful session. Uh, now may I invite Dr. Vaidya Lakshmi Nayak? Yes, sir. I, okay. uh, yeah. So, sir, I think it was eye opener. I think people who are here from other states uh, can uh, try to help uh, uh, develop the same mod um, model in their states also in the northeast. So we have many uh, leaders here. Dr. Lila Degamarti, who is the president of the ISCCP. We have Dr. Sarita Valirao. 
who was just the president of Mumbai Obstetrics and Gynecology Society. Madam, yes, sir. I have to go for a meeting, as I told you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so very much I'll for sharing you, time. Huh? Yes, sir. Thank you so much because okay, you have always you. been a like a leader in this field. So I think your uh, expertise and your opinion. Thank you very will, much, madam. We will be seeking your opinion me. from time and again and disturbing you, sir. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. And many congratulations for the extreme okay. efforts that you have put in. I think bringing a, in a policy into the government setup is not at all easy. Yes, and it's very difficult. Thank you again, sir. But yes. we should not lose heart. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you that is why I always that insist that to hear people from you. Shout at people. you. Yes, we sir. should not lose heart. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you, madam. Thank you so much. So we now go over to the next topic. Yeah, Pinaki. Yeah, uh, ma'am. Uh, next, uh, our next topic is on HPV testing and interpretation. It will be given by Dr. Bhagya Lakshmi Nayak, ma'am. Uh, she is professor, Department of Gynecologic Oncology, ASP, uh, GIC, Qatar. She is yes. co-chair Oncology Committee. Yes, yes. Pinaki, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So please uh, welcome, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, for this session. <laughs> Can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I will be discussing something about HPV testing. As all of you know, the new guidelines of WHO is now changing from VIA and cytology to a more specific test for screening. Uh, that's a more objective test and it is a human papillomavirus test. So HPV and cervical cancer, cervical cancer, it remains one of the gravest threats to women's lives worldwide. We all know that, and especially in our country. And cervical cancer is caused by high risk types of HPV. So we are all here for that reason only. And HPV is currently the most common sexually transmitted infection. So that again, we have to remember And 80% of women can be infected at some point in the lifetime and most infection clear naturally. So that's the biggest optimism about it is that most of them would clear naturally but the few which persist cause cervical cancer. And in rare cases, this infection may lead to cervical cancer when they persist, which is the most common gynecological malignancy worldwide. So virtually all cancers of the cervix are HPV positive, but in the re uh, recent past, we are getting some cancers which are really HPV negative, which are usually adenocarcinomas of the endocervical canal. And IARC, that is the International Agency of Research on Cancer, has classified this HPV viruses into carcinogens. One is a class one, other is a class two. Class one are the 16, 18, 31, 33 and the rest. And the class two are the 26, 53. So there they are carcinogens. And in the vaccinated population, we are seeing that the prevalence of 16, 18, along with closely related 31, 33, and 45 is uh, decreasing. And the rest, 51, 52, 53, etc., cetera, are increasing. So we need maybe we will in the future, we will need some other tests to detect these. So coming to a little to the background, because HPV is the causative agent of cervical cancer, detection of HPV has a potential to improve cervical cancer prevention programs. So HPV is present and accessible in infected exfoliated cell specimens, so it's so easy to collect, and allowing detection by molecular nucleic acid tests that utilize primers and probes to amplify DNA or RNA targets. So in May 2018, WHO uh, gave a call to action to eliminate cervical cancer. And uh, in this, we had some targets from 2030 that 90% of the girls should be fully vaccinated. By 15 years, 70% of women should be screened um, with an HPV test at 35 and 45 years of age and 90% should be managed appropriately and 30% reduction in mortality from cervical cancer. So today, uh, my talk will be on how to screen this 70% uh, women. So cross-sectional and randomized trials have demonstrated that screening based on HPV testing, either a standalone primary test or as core testing, has a significantly higher sensitivity for CIN2 plus and CN3 plus than cytology and results in a significantly better prevention of invasive cervical cancer. So here you can see that the sensitivity of the HPV test is higher 
and specificity is also high, uh, not like um, comparable to cytology, but it is very, also uh, equally high. So there is a little problem about the lower specificity because the lower specificity of the HRHPV test for CIN3 plus lesions resulting in over referral for colposcopy because as we know that HPV positive does not mean CIN3, but then it would lead to a little more higher referrals. And uh, this can be overcome by triaging the uh, high risk HPV positive women with some cytology, or you can do HPV genotyping or some kind of immunohistochemistry, or if you don't have anything, you can do a visual inspection with acetic acid, triage, and if there is a lesion, you then go ahead and treat that lesion. So at what age do we need to start uh, high-risk HPV testing? So it is never less than 30 years, because if you do it less than 30 years of age, it's very likely that we get a lot of uh, positive cases, which really have, do not have any uh, clinical implication. So, uh, this is, you have to remember, it's only above 30 years of age. So in April 2015, the US FDA has approved high-risk HPV test as a primary screening tool for cervical cancer. High-risk HPV testing is introduced in cervical screening. The test should be clinically validated and performed in a lab with experience in molecular testing. Laboratory should be accredited and HRHPV testing should be implemented preferably within a population-based screening program with a call and recall system. But at the same time, I would also like to say that uh, people who are practicing and a woman comes to you for a high risk HPV testing, I should, uh, you should always encourage that. So HPV tests used for cervical cancer screening are maybe DNA based or RNA based. In the DNA based, we have few techniques like the hybrid capture to care HPV, and one uh, Servista, Copas, Expert HP, so many things are available in the market. And the RNA based test is the Pretech, Aptima HPV, and Avantage. So the DNA based tests are all these which we have already discussed. And about uh, and among these, the Cobas 4800 is the most commonest used machine uh, platform these days. So these are again the hybrid capture to 13 high risk types collectively. Servista uh, uh, detects 14 high risk types collectively, and COBAS 4800 it 14 high risk types individually for type 16 and 18, and as a group for the remaining types, which is called partial genotyping. So this is the most commonest platform that we use, and there are other RNA-based tests also, which is called Aptima and the Pretec. So what are the strengths and limitations of this HPV test? HPV tests have the potential to improve cervical cancer prevention programs, may improve in sensitivity of precancer detection, provides an objective screening result, allows for self-collection. I think that's the biggest, biggest advantage because our women don't like to walk into your clinics to have a cytology done or a VIA done. So um, collecting the sample in the privacy of their homes is more acceptable uh, to our Indian women. And there is a workflow flexibility, laboratory versus clinic based, manual, automated or point of care platforms are available. Infrastructure requirements and equipment may not be accessible in low resource settings, but I think we are moving at very fast and India is going to um, have many centers that will be doing the HPV testing in the near future. And we need uh, for trained health care providers and laboratory personnel. So we need some trained um, manpower for this. So sample collection procedure for HPV DNA PCR, we, uh, an HPV sample collection kit is available, a cyto brush or broom is required and a tube containing liquid preservative. So this is the brush. So the brush is moved around the cervix around 360 degrees, maybe four to five times. We rinse the, sorry, we rinse the brush in the PCR collection medium, uh, close it tightly and send it to the laboratory. And, uh, or the other way is that we can break the head of the broom, which is detachable and put it into the uh, collection van and send it to the laboratory. So these are the methods and self-collection is a very practical method in, especially in the underserved population. Sensitivity is less than physician collected sample, but that's again minimal. And but because non-participation in screening programs is a greater risk. So I think uh, self-collection is a very, very practical method. So this is the 
device which is used for self collection kit and they can be taught how to collect it in the privacy of their homes so coming to the role in clinical practice of hpv testing the role of hpv testing is so many you can it can be used as a primary screening you can use it as a co testing when you have an abnormal cytology report you can use it as a follow up after treatment for a test of your you can do a triage of ascus abnormalities on the pap smear also so triaging of abnormal pap smear hpv testing for triaging in low grade smear abnormalities ascus and elsil also if you get a uh, report of ascus or elsil which is really confusing whether to treat or not you can do a hpv if it is hpv positive then a colposcopy is indicated similarly if you have a case in which you have already treated her for cin hpv testing can be done after treatment of cin and if it is negative she goes back to routine screening if she is positive she will still need a six monthly follow so role in primary screening we have our evidence from india from dr shankar narayan a single round of hpv testing has a significant decline in rate of advanced cervical cancer the death rate in cytology via and control group are same with cytology via and control group hpv testing is objective and reproducible minimal training and quality assurance is required so you can see here that the hpv test saves lives these are the results from the same study which uh, which was done so which test to choose so fda approved high risk hpv dna tests many are available one is a kiagen one is a hologix servista and the rosh cobas hpv test so cobas 4800 i've told it's a pcr based uh, platform in which 14 uh, high risk hpv types are detected and genotyping for hpv 16 and 18 is integrated into the assay concurrently it detects remaining 12 hpv types as a group so this is the cobas test where we get the result and extraction of dna and cellular um, the cellular dna so this is the machine uh, how it is done so we need um, at least Uh, 90 samples to run the machine, so that's a little difficult sometimes. But if you are doing it on a community level um, screening program, then the, there should be no issue at all. So real time polymerase chain reaction amplification. So this is the machine just to show you how it is done, and finally you get the report. Again, hybrid capture high risk HPV DNA test. It's C two high risk HPV DNA test targets thirteen high risk HPV types. This was the first test to receive the FDA approval right uh, back in 2005, and HC2 showed consistently higher sensitivity than cytology for CIN2 plus detection, but lower specificity in different populations all over the world. So this is the hybrid capture too, the how it is done. So I think we don't need to go into the details of that. So HPV testing improves detection of CIN3 at baseline, resulting in fewer cancers. So HPV positive does not mean that. Uh, she is uh, gone into cancer, so that's a it is a higher risk of developing CIN three. So it has a high sensitivity for detection of H cell lesions, high negative predictive value, high test reproducibility, and results in higher detection of CIN two plus in women aged twenty five to twenty nine compared to the same strategy starting at age thirty. So HPV only testing more colposcopies may be required if direct referral, especially if starting at early age. So more CIN two three are detected and may require more uh, treatments. So cross sectional and randomized trials have demonstrated this. This we have done already. So HPV test may miss ten percent of the CIN two plus as the best sensitivity we may expect is around ninety percent. So HPV negative VIA positive patients probably do not have any CIN two plus. And in the LLETZ arm, the positive predictive value of VIA was thirty percent to detect CIN two three in a high prevalent situation. The positive predictive value may be as low as five percent. So that is why VIA screen and treat results in huge amount of uh, results in huge amount of over treatment. So if virus is not there, progression is unlikely. So issues to be considered are of all the tests, good quality cytology has the best specificity. but the sensitivity of cytology is too low and it's very difficult to ensure quality in low resource settings the world is moving towards hpv testing till we have a more affordable hpv test vi is going to stay but i think we are moving ahead very fast so ensuring treatment of the screen positives is extremely important screen and treat ensures this linkage and our study has shown that 50% of the vi positive women had cin and were treated so diagnostic 
tools indicative of progressive disease. So HPV 16 L1 methylation and P16 Inc 4A, these are higher tests which will uh, which you would like to do to confirm whether she is going to have a progressive disease or not. The P16 protein is a cycle independent kinase and KI67 is again another uh, protein which can be tested to know progression. So this is uh, how the smears look like. If it is brown, it's P16. If it is red, it is KI67. So this is called a dual marker and gives you an idea of a progressive disease. So cervical cancer screening guideline for all resource settings. We have our best FOXI GCPR guidelines, which are there on the FOXI website. So finding carcinogenic HPV types does not provide a diagnosis of CN3 or cancer. It identifies a group of women in whom CN3 plus is more likely. So the world is moving towards HPV testing uh, being used for primary screening and so are we. So I think this is again to reiterate the same WHO guidelines for all of us that we need to vaccinate women girls 90% uh, by less than uh, less than 15 years, screening of 70% women at 35 and 45 by a high precision test, that's a HPV test, and reduction of mortality by 30%. So this would lead to elimination of cervical cancer, which is uh, incidence of less than four per 100,000. So this is called elimination because we cannot eradicate this disease completely. So the global view, it's simplified HPV tests are necessary. Self-collection will cut down the cost. Tracking and treatment of screen positives will be, become easier. And But the answer is screen and treat. We do, really do not have a single right answer. So uh, screening has to be performed well and there should be good population coverage and treatment of screen positives is the crux. So finally, we have to complement current effective programs to expand coverage and affordable HPV is the way forward. So we can, I think, uh, with all your help, we are 900 gynecologists in the Northeast. If you screen five women every day, 45,000 women are screened daily and we can eliminate it in one year. So seek the uh, cooperation of all the gynecologists in the Northeast to help us eliminate cervical cancer in the Northeast. So thank you very, very much for your patient hearing and help, need all your help and cooperation to carry forward this program in the Northeast. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael Lakshmi, ma'am. Uh, now may I request uh, Dr. Sarita, ma'am, uh, for her speech. Uh, Dr. Sarita, ma'am, is a fellow of the Royal College of Obstetrician and Gynecologist, UK, 2011. Clinical experience for 23 years. She has a teaching experience for MD for nine years, DNB for 12 years, DGO for 12 years. She is also experienced as an examiner for DGO, FCPS, DFP for eight years. Ma'am, please join us. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction, Dr. Barua. And thank you, Dr. Bhagya Lakshmi, for involving me in this program. I'm just going to start my uh, slide. Am I audible? And can you see my slides? Um, yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah can you move a little down. towards the your instrument? Your voice is a little low. It's clear, but a little low. One second. Huh? I'll just uh, do that. I'll just see. Is it better now? Is it better? Is the voice better now? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Or is it better now? Yes, it's much better now. Much better. Now, okay, much okay. Better. I think it's the headphones. So, uh, I'll, with that, uh, I'd just like to... Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, I just begin this one minute. Huh? Sorry, I'm just going ahead by... So, uh, the, my topic for today is HPV positive. What next? And I'm very happy to be part of this Foxy, Figo, uh, Sapho. Uh, cervical cancer free zone. One second. Oh, I think this. Huh? Yeah, I think yeah. Please make yeah. it full screen. No, no. Uh, my screen sharing is paused. I'm just uh, seeing why that happened. Just a minute. Has somebody paused it from that side? No, ma'am. No? Shall I share screen again? Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, is that fine? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes, now it's full screen. Yes. Yeah, is it better now? Now you can see it. So, uh, what I'm saying, uh, yeah. Please so, make we've it full screen. I think uh, you have not met it full screen. Uh, on my screen, it is full screen. On yours, it's not full screen? No. Okay, it is full screen on mine. 
Okay. Okay, you one, can continue. No issue. One second. Okay, one second. I'm doing it again. Huh? And I've gone into uh, the thing. And now I'm going into slideshow. Mm. One sec. Huh? I'm going into slideshow. Here I'm going into slideshow. Is it full screen? Is it full screen now? No. No. I can't understand. On my screen, I'm seeing full screen. Is there okay. someone here from the technical side? Ma'am, yes, ma'am. Uh, if it is of uh, Microsoft PPTs of older version, uh, this problem will be coming, ma'am. Really? But this is a yeah. brand new presentation I made last month. Anyway, okay, doesn't matter. You can see the slide, no? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, yes, okay. Can so, see. so I began, begin with this uh, slide with of Harold Zur Hossen just to say that we've come a long way and we really remember him for his discovery of the HPV virus causing cervical cancer. But it is a problem in clinical practice. And now that we are testing more and more patients with HPV infection, how do we manage these patients? So the first thing we need to understand is what is the natural history of HPV infection. And when we look at HPV infection, we know that as most patients will clear this infection. And when we look at patients, uh, you know, there is a long time interval between them getting HPV and developing CIN and developing invasive cancer. So what is important here is that whether they clear the infection or the infection remains persistent. And this is a very nice diagram which looks at the years since infection with carcinogenic HPV. And you can see how the graph is showing that not more than 95% will clear in two years or in, and in, in three years. And it is only those who have persistent uh, HPV infection that Excuse are... Excuse me, madam, your uh, slides are not moving. We are not able to see any movement of your slides. One sec. Now, one sec, one sec. Yeah, can you see the slide now? No, ma'am. We are seeing only the first slide. Are you are seeing only the first slide? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, wait, 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 wait. One second. Now, just let me go back. I've stopped sharing. I just can't understand this. I'm going to just, uh, Dr. Bhagyalakshmi, just give me two minutes. I'm going to open. Okay, now just see, is it okay? Can you see? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Now you it's perfect, see? perfect. And it is on full screen? Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Super. Yes, okay, yes. we've Thank achieved you. this. Okay, and now is it, I'm trying to move it. Are bapre. Now see, yeah, is it moving? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah. So the possible outcomes of HPV infection are clearance, persistence, and progression. This is the first important thing. And I tell my patients also, and I show them the graph and tell them that, look, there's a very high chance that you will clear this infection. It's only a minority of patients in which it is persistent and a very small number where the infection will progress. But since we don't know who is where it is going to be persistent and who it is going to progress, we have to follow all these patients very carefully. So if you look at the stages of HPV infection, and this is from an old article by Christine Bergeron from Actor Cytologica in 2016. And she said that the stages are, look at it, latent phase, productive phase, transforming phase, and invasive phase. In the latent phase, the cytology may be normal, and uh, it is only the P16, which is um, or the mRNA. In the productive phase, there is low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. In the transforming phase, there's high-grade SIL. And in the invasive phase, it goes to cancer. So what is important here is that we are mostly picking up our patients. If they, are, they don't have any cyto cytological changes, they are in the latent phase. Now, what has been changed? HPV testing is replacing cytology for cervical cancer screening due to the high sensitivity and the superior reassurance following a negative test. And this was told to us very beautifully just now by Dr. Bhagya Lakshmi. And the negative predictive value is very high. But when an HPV test is positive, the positive predictive value is not that good. That means that a large number of patients who develop, who are HPV positive, will never develop any CIN or go on to de develop cancer. The next important message is approximately a dozen genotypes cause cervical cancer. 
management of these women testing positive, there is still a dilemma and is still unresolved. And the biggest dilemma we are facing in clinical practice is because a large number of women are HPV positive, we don't want to give them over treatment. And we don't want to overload our healthcare services and we don't want to do no harm. So several countries have now updated their screening guidelines and are switching from primary LBC to a primary high-risk HPV testing with a liquid-based cytology triage, which is also what Dr. Bhagyalakshmi said, that we are moving more and more towards primary high-risk HPV testing, which means that more women are going to come back positive. We are going to have a large number of women who are positive, and we have to follow them up very carefully, and we definitely want to avoid over-treatment and do no harm. So there are different strategies. Earlier, we were doing cytology with reflex HPV testing. Then we started doing co-testing, where cytology, which is still being done in many countries, where cytology plus HPV testing is done. And the latest strategy is now to do primary HPV screening. So HPV testing versus liquid-based cytology. Randomized trials have shown that high-risk HPV tests have greater sensitivity than cytology. They afford greater protection against cervical cancer. Those who are HPV negative, their screening interval can be safely extended. We can send them away for five years and focus on those who are HPV positive. But, but, but remember that there is reduced specificity and excessive referral to colposcopy is a problem. So now we have a trial of a positive high-risk HPV using reflex liquid-based cytology. So those who come positive, we have to do their liquid-based cytology and then manage them. So this is a very nice observational study, which is the UK cervical screening program, which looked at a large number of women, 578,000 women. And they looked at two groups, one with primary screening with uh, HPV and the other with primary screening with LBC. And if you can just look at the main, uh, the results and the conclusions, what they said was routine primary screening increased the detection of CIN grade three or worse and cervical cancer by approximately 40% and 30% respectively compared with liquid-based cytology. The very low incidence of CIN grade three or worse after three years supports extending the screening interval. So which suggests that women who are HPV negative, we can be safely sent back for three years at least, if not five, when those who are HPV positive are the ones that we have to focus on. So we come to what do we do when the patients are positive high-risk HPV? If they are cytology, they may be cytology positive or cytology negative. And I remind you of the first slide where I showed you the latent phase and then I showed you the next phase. If they are cytology positive, they have an increased risk of disease and they should be subjected to colposcopy and increased uh, because they have an increased risk of disease. If they are cytology negative, then they can be watched carefully and the HPV test can be repeated, but early recall is very important. Now, in that study, 50% or more of CIN grade 2 or worse were detected, 40% more CIN grade 3 or worse were detected, and 30% more cervical cancers were detected, suggesting that high-risk HPV performs as a very good screening test and the uh, sensitivity is very high. So they said that baseline high-risk HPV testing and early recall required 80% more colposcopies, detected substantially more CIN than liquid-based cytology. Primary high-risk HPV cervical screening is practicable on a large scale and confers approximately 40% greater sensitivity for CIN grade 3 or worse and approximately 30% greater sensitivity for cervical cancer than liquid-based cytology and a marked reduction in incidence after three years supports extension of the screening intervals. Now, so in the UK example, 2,500 women are diagnosed with cervical cancer each year. One fourth are diagnosed after negative cytology. Screening with high-risk HPV would lead to a 20% decrease in overall incidence, which means translates into 400 to 500 fewer cases. And the UK screening program started in 1988 has resulted in a 30% decrease in incidence.
but after 2002 this has plateaued and it is not going down further and maybe screening with hpv is the answer and further decrease is possible only with primary high risk hpv screening and vaccination so this is a very nice article by Dr. Mirja Bhatla and Dr. Seema Singhal. And they also said that primary HPV screening will lead to more CI and lesions at lower cost. The availability of clinically validated HPV tests is a concern. And we have to triage these patients that who are HPV positive, then to liquid-based cytology, to genotyping, and this is to avoid the harm of overtreatment and harm of overtreatment is one of the probable problems of primary HPV screening. So they've said that the high sensitivity of HPV test makes it ideal for population-based screening. Primary HPV screening recommended five yearly from the age of 25 years. In order to eliminate cervical cancer, it is recommended that each country should achieve at least 70% screening coverage by an effective HPV screening test by 2030, and 90% of these lesions should be treated. Now, this is the most important line. HPV test positivity does not imply disease. These women should be triaged according to a predefined triage pro 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 protocol, and only clinically validated HPV tests should be used for primary HPV screening. So this, a lot of counseling goes into this, and we really have to talk to our patients. As Dr. Bhagya Lakshmi said, self-sampling is another very important method and will help us to cover the patients in a better way. It will grant, grants privacy, it increases the uptake, and it really uh, you know, will help us. But there are difficulties in follow-up and reluctance to report for treatment. What to do with these HPV uh, patients? We have very good GCP. PR guidelines from Foxy, and here we have good resource and limited resource settings, and these are the triage tools when we do a primary HPV test. We do cytology, we do an HPV genotyping for 16 and 18, or a colposcopy and biopsy. If in a limited resource setting, then colposcopy with biopsy. And the management options include large loop excision of the transformation zone, conization, cryo or thermal coagulation. And in lower resource settings, again, cryo, leap, conization, and thermal coagulation. And the see and treat approach has been recommended. We also now say screen and treat approach. So this is what we do with HPV positive, what we should do. If they are HPV positive, then we have to go for either VIA, cytology, or HPV genotyping. If the VIA is negative, repeat HPV testing at one year. Again, they may be HPV negative or positive. If they have cleared the infection, HPV negative, then return to routine five yearly screening protocol. If HPV positive again, then colposcopy and biopsy. And again, if the colposcopy biopsy is normal, repeat HPV testing again at one year so that we are giving them more time to clear it. If it is abnormal, we have to follow the CIN management protocol. If they are HPV positive and we are using cytology, if the lesion is negative for intraepithelial lesion or malignancy, repeat HPV testing at one year. If it is anything more than ASCUS, go for colposcopy with biopsy. Again, when you repeat the HPV testing, if it is HPV negative now, that means they've cleared the infection, return to routine five yearly screening protocol. If they are HPV positive, colposcopy and biopsy. And if the colposcopy biopsy is normal, repeat HPV testing, or if it is abnormal, follow the CIN management. And the last approach, the third approach is to do HPV genotyping for 16 and 18. If they are positive for 16 and 18, they should go directly for colposcopy and biopsy because we know these are the more uh, virulent viruses. And if they are other high-risk HPV positive, then repeat HPV testing at one year. So I think that this chart number one really covers my topic in, you know, in one slide, what to do when the patient is HPV positive. We also have WHO guidelines. And here I'm showing you the WHO guidelines. If the patient is HPV positive, they are recommending visual inspection. If the VIA is negative, rescreen after a year. If the VIA is positive, 
eligible for cryotherapy, the zone is the transformation zone is well visualized. You can treat with cryotherapy. Not eligible with cryotherapy, treat with LEAP. If it is suspicious for cancer, then it has to be referred to for appropriate diagnosis. Counseling is very important for these patients because many patients believe they will worry that they have got cancer the moment the HPV test is positive, which is not true. And these three points, if you remember, is enough for counseling. Most HPV infections are transient and will be cleared in two years. A positive HPV test does not mean that the woman will develop cancer. In fact, cancer is a rare outcome of a very common infection. And further tests and careful follow-up or treatment is necessary so that the woman does not develop cancer. So I think these three points, if we keep in our mind and we counsel with these three points, and sometimes I write them down because I've realized now that patients forget what you have said. They're not, after some time, they can't remember. But if you, you have written it down and given it to them, they can again see these points very carefully. So this is just a little of my own experience. And this is to show you how we have our tests. They come for HPV 16, 18, or other high-risk positive. And this is a patient of mine who had that. There's a very nice type-specific HPV natural history article and implications for cervical screening. And though the clinical value of typing is debated, it's very interesting that the individual HPV types have different natural histories. And using of usage of typing following primary HPV testing is a very important thing. And this HPV typing can be used in clinical management. What the author said is that the most important predictors of the risk of pre-cancer at baseline testing are the HPV status, the type group, how long they've been HPV positive, and what is their cytology with high-grade cytology being more significant. Here you can see the cumulative risk of, uh, as I showed you in the beginning, and you can see how the almost 98% have been uh, cleared, a few have uh, persisted, and a small minority have uh, progressed. And this is in time in years since the first detection. And here we can also see this is uh, risk of CIN3, and this is for the different HPV types. You can see 16 here, 33 here, 18, and the other types. But overall, after seven years, 90% had cleared, 5% persist, and only 3% will progress. So the risk of progression is dependent on the HPV type. And you can see at the top is HPV 16. The risk with 18 and 45, the risk of adenocarcinoma is more. And the other HPV types, the risk of progression is less. So HPV 16 has the highest risk of pro progression unless other HPV types, it was linked to continually increased cumulative risk reaching a risk of 21.5% by year seven. 33 also showed a high cumulative risk with 18.4% progression, but it is much less common. All other HPV types had much lower cumulative risk than 16 and 33. Prevalent infections had a higher risk of progression than incident infections. And 16 and 33 tend to clear less often than other HPV types the great majority of infections had cleared within three years. Now, just to end, we have a fully automated HPV uh, assay. The turnaround time is much faster. And in 60 minutes, they are saying that we will get a report. So as we progress, things are getting better and better. And we really have to know how to manage these patients very carefully. So my take home messages are that HPV based screening has greater sensitivity superior reassurance, HPV genotypes range substantially in risk of progression. Within one or two years of exposure in immunocompetent population, most HPV infections will be cleared. The HPV risk group, the prevalent in incident status permit excellent risk of prediction and high grade cytology correlates highly with CIN3, but low grade abnormalities are less important modulators. With that, I thank you all for a patient hearing.
थैंक यू मैम सो विथ दिस वी कम एंड ऑफ द फर्स्ट सेशन नेक्स्ट सेशन इज ऑन कॉलपोस्कोपी फॉर डेट आई वुड लाइक टू इन्वाइट डॉक्टर प्रिया गणेश मैम Dr. Priya Ganesh Kumar, ma'am, is a Foxy Oncology Committee chairperson from 2021 to 24. She is a medical director of Saniwas Chain of Preventive Oncology Center, Pan India Chain of 25 Preventive Oncology Center. Mentorship and training regarding her mentorship and training, she is a WHO IARC or IFCPC colposcopy and cytology course trainer for India. Foxy colposcopy course conductor. So far, she has trained more than thousand gynecologists in India. Official master trainer for course in colposcopy via N preventive oncology for National Health Mission Government of NP under Ayushman Bharat. PhD guide external for Bharatiya Vidya Pit University Pune. She has the following books and publications. Author of Colposcopy in Practical Gynecology, reference book for PG, second edition, CBS publication. Author of Atlas of Colposcopy and Cytology, authored by Dr. B. K. Iyer. Official reviewer for COGI, Foxy Journal Oncology section. Executive member in Foxy, okay. GCTR uh, for Cervical okay. Cancer Prevention and Screening. She has also received many awards and recognition. Thank Gaurav Mayo Award 2016 for preventive oncology and introducing the science of colposcopy first time in Kent's district. Ma'am, please welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. There's no need for so much of an elaborate uh, this thing, you know. Just names are enough because we can concentrate. I'm just sharing my slide. Yeah, so okay. Dr. Priya requested to take both the talks. One is on instrumentation, the other is on interpretation so i think you can Is my slide talk. full screen yeah yeah yes no huh? okay so and that's what i've made this as colposcopy interpretation instruments yes yes yeah so thank you very much uh for that uh, elaborate uh, and i bring greetings from mumbai uh colposcopy the word colposcopy for most of us see it's like a it's like a mystery thing like however we have this uh, third eye of lord shiva Normally, I like to uh, state that, you know, colposcopy is the third eye of gynecologist. It is actually revealing so many things which are hidden and which, which then gets manifested later on. So that's exactly how uh, to use. So now in this uh, chart of mine, I've been assigned two lectures. Uh, on One is on colposcopy and the other one is of instrumentation, reporting, dilemmas and reporting and all that. Thing. So let's go through this lecture. So Singer Monahan had nicely said that colposcopy with a directed biopsy is a gold standard. Whenever we want to do a colposcopy, we have to get adapted. Yeah, can you be a little louder? Can you come a little towards the... <coughs> Am I okay now? <coughs> There's yes, some voice be. problem. In yeah, yeah, now it's fine. Now it's fine. That's okay. Yeah. So terminologies and uh, nomenclature in colposcopy is a very important part when we have to understand then it becomes easy for us to interpret a, a colposcopic report. So let's uh, now go quickly with all the terminologies quickly so that it's a revision. This is a refresher course. So I'm sure all of you all are doing colposcopy uh, and uh, we have had this type of course last year. Uh, so here we will not be, uh, you, might, you will find this very familiar. Talking about uh, squamous epithelium, which is a multiple layer epithelium. That is the main reason why we are seeing this epithelium as pink color. And again, one thing to remember is squamous epithelium is not always straight line as a basement membrane. It is thrown into folds, which is called as uh, stromal papillae. And that is the basis of uh, punctation when you see it from the head-on view. Then coming to the columnar epithelium, which is a uh, single-layered epithelium, so you can see the stroma, the stroma blood vessels very nicely. So they are red color epithelium. And normally it is thrown into folds and that's the basic reason why it appears granular, velvety, grape-like. So these are the various descriptions when we talk about columnar epithelium. For a colposcopist, it's very, very important. Even why a colposcopist, even for a routine screening program with VIA, 
SCJ is a very, very important, uh, uh, you know, terminology to understand. So what is a squamous columnar junction? It's a junction between the squamous epithelium and the columnar epithelium. Now, the basis of this is, um, you know, further on, we have transition transformation zone, TZ, which is a transition zone. It's a dynamic epithelium. So now let's understand this, that in the pubertal age, we do have in the prepubertal age, the SCJ, that's a squamous columnar junction within the os. So you're not seeing anything, you know, if you uh, happen to see an adolescent or, you know, this type of thing. That it's it's you don't see that it's all withdrawn inside. Then with the advent of the puberty, there is a growth of the columnar epithelium, and there is a flow if, uh, through the least resistance pathway. So the least resistance pathway happens to be def definitely the external os. So you will see that during the adolescent, uh, no, in the early reproductive age, you will see a lot of red color epithelium. Many a times. Uh, people have used misnomers like erosions, ya ghao ho gaya, ya something ulcers. So many terms are used for this erosion, for this ectopia. Normally, we call that as an ectopy. Now, what do you mean by an ectopy? When the columnar epithelium is two-third of the cervix, it's an ectopy. Now, what is an ectropion? There is another term called ectropion in that after post-delivery, you would have seen lateral tear and the cervix getting everted. So you would see a lot of columnar epithelium because of the eversion of the you know, two lips of the surface. So that's an ectropion. So whatever may be the case. Now, here you have two-third. I mean, it's almost two-third. So what is the main problem is you see a lot of white discharge in these cases. Now, since now this is a single-layered epithelium, it's bathed in the vaginal pH. It cannot take up that acidity, you know, that acidic pH. And hence, it has to get converted into a robust epithelium which is a multiple layered epithelium. And that conversion from a single layered epithelium to a multiple layered epithelium or uh, the thing is called metaplasia. So we call that as a squamous metaplasia. And now since this has become metaplastic, we do have two junctions. So one junction is the original SCJ, which is a junction between the squamous epithelium and the squamous metaplastic epithelium. And the other junction is the new SCJ, which is a junction between the metaplastic squamous and the columnar epithelium. And in between is your transformation zone. So whenever you are able to see the whole thing, like the columnar epithelium, squamous, your, uh, you know, this uh, SCJ and everything, it is then your, your TZ1. Similarly, what happens is now, whenever there is a lot of uh, this thing, you know, with the age progresses, this new SCJ, which is again a dynamic epithelium, it's like all getting converted into metaplasia. And hence you would see it is regressing inside. And that is like transformation zone two. This is transformation zone three when you're not able to see the SCJ. This is a very, very important structure. And now I brought certain all the photographs for understanding this. So this is definitely a transformation zone one, but I'm able to see the whole of the columnar epithelium this uh, new SCJ after application of acetic acid is appearing bold white line. And uh, you can see the uh, distant crypt opening, which gives you understanding of um, new, uh, though you can join the doubt dots, arbitrary joining of the dots, giving you an understanding of original SCJ. So you have an original SCJ, you have a new SCJ, and in between is a transformation zone. Why is this transformation zone very important for us? Uh, Dr. Sarita had given a wonderful uh, understanding and Bhagya had given understanding about HPV. HPV is an epithelotropic virus. It requires dividing cells uh, for it to survive. <clears throat> so where do you have the dividing cells? This new SCJ, these are all this dynamic epithelium. They are dividing cells. And hence you would find whatever is the affected ones are coming, no? the HPV affected cells are nearing this new SCJ. And hence you would find the lesions arising from new SCJ within the transformation zone. That's very, very important. And again, you can see this is again another new, uh, your, you can see the new SCJ like a bold line. And you're having this all or your dotted line, which are the, the um, you arbitrary join it. And the dots are, these are all which I'm showing over here. Now, arbitrary joining of these dots gives you an understanding of uh, old SCJ, new SCJ by this bold line, and this is transformation. 
Now, whenever there is an ectopion, ectropion, the transformation zone is very small because the whole thing is covered by uh, columnar epithelium. So that's a challenge. So whenever you have a challenge, you know, these are the challenge because you see an hypertrophic cervix, you see a big, uh, you know, ectropion and you, you have a very small uh, a transformation zone. So you have to go and identify whether we have missed out any acet uh, acetovite area within the transformation zone. So these are the challenges actually when you face. Now, what is a, a zone two, a type two transformation zone when you are seeing a very small strip of columnar epithelium and the STJ is partially visible or sometimes very um, visible near the os. Now, these things you would find in a, you know, a, a premenopausal, perimenopausal age group. And then you have transformation zone three when it's completely withdrawn inside. This you are seeing mostly in a menopausal age group, but in my now uh, experience of doing colposcopy since past uh, two and a half decades, what I've found is it's not always necessary that they follow this protocol, this dictum of age. Many a times I've even seen transformation zone one in a, in a, in a uh, menopausal age group. Sometimes I've seen TZ3 even in an early uh, reproductive age group. So it's not always a dictum. So there are exceptions. This is something that you will have to again understand. What are the indications for colposcopy? Screen positives like VI positive, HPV positive, PAP above askers. Uh, many a times you do have these screen negatives, but the cervix is unhealthy. She comes with a persistent white discharge. There are hypocritic patches. Now, as per as your, um, uh, you know, this uh, ASSCP guidelines came up very beautifully in 2019. And the new ASCP guidelines came up with and making us understand that do a colposcopy on the symptom base also, you can do it. Like, you know, there is a symptom of postcoital bleeding or postmenopausal bleeding or intermenstrual bleeding. You can go ahead straight away doing a colposcopy. Now let's go to the steps of colposcopy. After the consent, after explaining to her, take her to the uh, lithotomy or take her to the edge of the table. You need not uh, give a lithotomy every time. Uh, she can keep her uh, space, you know, she can keep her legs little wide, uh, legs folded, hips uh, at the uh, near the table. Now, choose the right speculum. This is something which I always tell to my candidates when they come for our courses also. That do not, you know, first of all, she's so scared. She's so this thing and you're taking a small pelvis, large uh, speculum, trying to insert and she's shouting and then you're causing an iatrogenic trauma onto the cervix. All these should not be done. Uh, you should be having uh, different types of speculum. Choose the right type of speculum. Don't go harsh and uh, no try to cause any uh, this thing. And sometimes, you know, cervix are uh, into different, different, uh, you know, um, uh, directions you would have seen cervix might be drooping down up here there do not start a colposcope unless and until the the cervix is pointed right in the middle very very important things um because we are in a big hurry or might be like you know you have a huge patient uh, list and you want to do it first uh, fix it up let the cervix be looking at you then start the procedure so clean with the normal saline, what will you see? You will look for the distal crypt openings. That's how you're going to identify the digital uh, uh, distal SCG. You might look for a polyp. You might look for an abortion cyst, hyperkeratic patches. Then switch on to the green filter. The purpose of the green filter is to identify blood vessel pattern, whether there are any mosaics or punctations, abnormal blood vessel patterns. Then come back to the white base. Again, I tell this to all my candidates. Many a times what happens in some of the instruments you have that in the same thing you press and you might feel you they have different types of grades, you know, G1, GF, 1, 2, 3, and in promise and all you have till 5, even blue green filter in some of the colposcopes. And uh, the nearby one is the uh, pressing to the uh, white base. Many a times the older versions used to have you press it there and then. So the doctors are with GF1. They might think that we have come to a white base. Why am I stressing so much on this point? Because the interpretation really then differs when you go for an acetic acid application. That the, the hue of green is there and you're not able to actually identify the acetal whiteness. Then you will switch on, as I told you, we'll switch back to the white base. You will apply 5% acetic acid. I'm coming to all that point one by one. For one minute, you will apply and you will observe for one minute. So that's two minutes. And then... Remove the extra acetic acid. 
again i'm stressing these practical points because you all are this is a refresher course and i'm sure you all are been doing colposcopy so uh, these are the small tips and tricks which i'm giving um, out of experience of course uh, that you know when you remove this extra acetic acid otherwise what happens it's it's lying down on that uh, uh, on that uh, this thing and uh, for next and when you're applying lugol the lugols gets diluted the lugols the the lugols picture gets diluted so we don't want to have that so after application take a plain cotton remove that extra one which is now fallen fallen like a gutter remove that wait for one minute take nice pictures if it's a video call posco and uh, every 15 seconds is what i always tell um, um, uh, our candidates and lugols then you apply lugols now lugols and all you don't have to time it up that's one thing let's go with a normal saline application so normal saline application you will uh, look for uh, this uh, all the as i told you distal crypt openings you will look for uh, any polyp or anything then is the uh, coming to normal pattern blood vessel pattern so these are all normal blood vessel pattern now blood vessel patterns are very very important uh, and it's actually these are the patterns which actually makes you understand colposcopic cases in a much much better fashion like this comes this reticular blood vessel patterns are usually seen in the original squamous this type of you know branching patterns you will see in the metaplastic epithelium this type of uh, you know this is a trichomonial uh, type of pattern now this hairpin bend pattern you will see plenty in a menopausal age group now this type of regular long regular branching pattern you will see it on a uh, nebothian and then long parallel blood vessel pattern you will see it on uh, you know healing blood vessel uh, blood tissues so many a times you know whenever you have treated with a uh, lets and she comes back to you after say 6 months for a relook colposcopy and that area if you had this long parallel blood vessel pattern it makes you understand even before putting an acetic acid ki yes your tissue is healing so you know in this way the patterns are developed and and and, and actually it gives you a lot of understanding So this is an abortion. You can see this branching pattern. Then out over here, as I told you, this is again is a nice comb up, and you can see over here patterns like you know regular branching pattern. These are into metaplastic epithelium. Then you will see this mesh type of reticular pattern in the original squamous epithelium. Now we come to abnormal blood vessel pattern. Now look at this abnormal blood vessel pattern. So these are all. If you happen to see an abnormal blood vessel pattern on the acetovite area. that has a significance like suppose if i am doing a uh, uh, this thing in a green filter i suddenly find this type of waste thread like a bizarre thread like pattern do i put any significance to that i would keep it in my mind okay at 2 o'clock i had seen this pattern now when i apply an acetic acid and there you have an acetovite area which is now having in that same coinciding then it has a significance because these are very small tips um, uh, because after uh, when we are teaching our candidates and they uh, get overwhelmed when they see this type of small patterns but you have to understand in the at the base of the mind is you will have to have all these in that same coinciding into the same thing then it has a significance now when we see over here we have over here you know you can see over here you can have this um, uh, mosaic types of pattern then there are plenty of you can see over here these are mosaics as well as these are hairpin bend widen hairpin bend pattern coma type of patterns here to you are seeing plenty can you can see over here corkscrew type of pattern uh, then widen hairpin bend pattern so many patterns if you are uh, happen to see this on the acetal white area chalky area you can take it for sure this is going to be an hsil might be a micro invasive ca so that's where the relevance of this patterns are coming to a uh, via we all know why do we do a vi the principle is acetic acid coagulates the intracellular protein obscuring the passage of light thus turning acetovirus it has to be freshly prepared 24 hours you can use it label it 0.5 ml glacial acetic acid to 9.5 ml of distilled water for 10 ml either you can use 1 ml to 19 or 5 ml to 95 it has to be freshly prepared that's one thing very important now talking about a metaplasia so wherever where can you see physiologically vi a positive I mean, that means what i apply but it's a physiological thing i need not worry so we have understood that 
acetic acid principle is whenever there is a high NC ratio, you're going to have that acetoacetoacetoacetoacetoate area out there. The importance and the relevance of a colposcopist is to identify which is physiological and which is pathological. Unless and until you identify that, you will be going ahead taking punch biopsies time and again. So you have to have that understanding that if there is a metaplasia, what is the significance? How do I understand it? So if it is thin, shiny, translucent, without any set geographical pattern, it need not arise from SCJ. It might just arise and disappear fast. It is cloudy. It's merging with the rest of the tissues. So if it's, and it might sometimes appear focally in the columnar epithelium. So they just come and they disappear. It doesn't have any set geographical pattern and it is translucent. They are shiny. Now, what all do you see after putting an acetic acid? The first thing you will try to find, find out is the new SCJ. You will have squamous metaplasia. You can see many a times even columnar epithelium, you know. Normally, columnar epithelium is a single-layered epithelium and it's a very small nucleus in the basal. It doesn't turn acetoid. But if it is having a covering of um, uh, this thing, you know, immature squamous metaplasia or even immature squamous metaplasia, whenever there is a covering of metaplasia, these uh, red looking ones sometimes turn uh, white, but these whiteness will again disappear fast. So that's very important. Satellite lesion sometimes turns acetoid white. Congenital TZ uh, is acetoid white. Hypocritic patches become more white. So here we have with you, uh, with here, metaplasia, where you have thin, shiny, translucent. Merging with the rest of the tissues, you can see over here. Cloudy in appearance. Then you come to pathological. Pathological is definitely arising from SCJ. Now a low-grade lesion, because it's, uh, you know, uh, the low-grade lesions takes a little time to manifest. They may be feathery in margin, but they have to arise from SCJ. It will be um, uh, milky white, and uh, many a times it need not be thick, dense, opaque, but definitely <clears throat> there will be a opacity. They will have a set geographical pattern which will arise from SCJ. High-grade lesions are very easy to identify. They might have chalky, distant uh, oyster white, rolled margins, you know, they, so you have this low-grade lesions, they appear late and disappear a little later. And, uh, but the high-grade lesions, they instantly appear, you know, and then they disappear very late. So you have this pathological VIA like LCL, let's say invasive CA, condylomatous lesions, and you can see over here, this I have taken from IARC textbook. So you have over here, uh, you can moderately dense and then you have, uh, you know, heavy dense uh, and it's rolled out margin, it's going intracerve. You can see it's going endocervix. This is a uh, uh, circumorofacial lesions, which you are seeing. Then comes the principle of Lugol's. After acetic acid, you're putting a Lugol's. What is the principle? Now, Vilai is visual inspection with Lugol's iodine. The uh, tissues which have glycogen, superficial uh, layer of this thing, you know, like uh, cells do have glycogen, they turn magony brown on application of Lugol's iodine. And uh, cells which do not have like columnar epithelium or an immature metaplasia, they will not turn brown on application of Lugol's. So you have uh, physiological conditions where, you know, villi is negative, that is, Lugol's are taken up, becoming Megoni brown. They are original squamous, mature squamous metaplasia. Now, physiological cases where villi Lugol's is not taken up, like they are like positive, they are like columnar epithelium, immature squamous epithelium, nebotian sometimes, menopausal epithelium. So here you have villi negative, where you have this Lugol's very well taken up, Megoni brown, and the columnar epithelium is just painted. You know, it will just turn to pink color instantly. Now, coming up to villi positives, CIN cases, uh, definitely, and they do not get the time to mature, right? So they are always basal parabasaloid cells. So they will be <clears throat> not turned, they'll, they'll turn something like, you know, the yellow pattern, mustard yellow can come up, or you can have a canary yellow, mustard yellow, saffron yellow coming up. So the color change would be there. Trichomonial infections will have a leopard skin patches. Like I brought over here a few cases. These are all from my own test book as of this thing. So we have over here, uh, you can see over here, this is your uh, columnar epithelium. This is the os. <clears throat> this is the columnar epithelium, but this is what is the uh, lesion. 
And these are trichomonial patches. Again, this is the os and this is the lesion. This is satellite lesion. This is the uh, columnar epithelium. These are various lesions and these are satellite lesions. Whenever you have done uh, all this, you are supposed to document it. And this is how you document into a cartier cartier diagram. So you have over here the acetobite areas and with you are showing patterns, mosaic patterns, punctations. You are up, putting a bold line for new SCJ and a dotted line for original SCJ and you're showing it by depiction. Then comes your terminologies, how to report. So you have an IFCPC nomenclature, you have modified read your sweet scoring. I'm going to talk about IFCPC now. I'm going to take you through each and every, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever is written over here. Each and every topic let's cover with pictorial diagrams. So first thing you will see is adequate, inadequate. Inadequate is said when you're not able to see the cervix is obscured by inflammation or bleeding or scarring. Now gone are the days when you used to say satisfactory, unsatisfactory. It's all gone. You know, you don't use it. But I've, I'm seeing that even now people, the old timers are still using it. So that term is gone off. And now we are not talking about SCJ seen or not seen. We are talking about cervixes adequately seen or cervixes not seen because of blaring, bleeding, scarring, inflammation. Then you'll talk about <clears throat> SCJ visible, partially, completely or not visible. Then you'll talk about transformation zone one, two and three, corroborative to what you're finding in your SCJ. <clears throat> then you will comment on the, uh, no, no, if there is a normal thing, you'll comment on the, uh, all that thing, nebothin is there or not, ectopy and all that. Then you'll comment on abnormal. So let's see individual ones. This is an adequate colposcopy. This is an inadequate colposcopy. Here the SCJ is completely seen. So TZ1, partially seen, TZ2, not seen, TZ3. Then this is a mature colposcopy where you are seeing everything. This is an atrophic epithelium. This is an ectopy. This is an ectropion. Then I, I told you, if you remember just now, that you know these are all challenges. Suppose might be she has, this is a very small, thin, narrow columnar, repair, the transformation zone. If she has a lesion over here, it's definitely going to not come into your vision. And that's the reason you're supposed to look into 360 degrees whenever you're going to observe VIA. Then this is a metaplasia. These are nebothian, crypt openings, right? Deciduous in pregnancy. Then you can have a thin, you can have this, you know, a thin aceto whiteness, where it is located. How many uh, size, what is the size, what is the quadrant? And now over here, this is a little bit of a dense aceto whiteness. All right, then here we have this condolomatous lesion, hyperkeratic patches. Now then this is a actual erosion because then there you have this, you know, that's with inner border sign. So all these things are put up over here. You can see sharp border, inner border sign over here. And uh, you can see fine mosaic patterns over here. So all these things are to be to uh, spoken. Atypical vessels, ulcerations, fragile vessels, necrosis, congenital TZ, where you can see the acid of whiteness going into the anterior and lower lip uh, of, the, of the fornices, anterior fornix and the uh, posterior fornix. Condyloma, polyps, congenital anomalies, double cervix, septum. Many, then over here, miscellaneous findings like uh, uh, endometriosis, fibroids, nebothian, infected nebothian, herpetic patches. So all these things you have to put it up whenever you're going to do a nomenclature. We come to the sweet scoring. Then now sweet scoring. So whenever you've reported it, you will also report if you find a lesion, you do the uh, scoring system. That's how you understand. And that's how you will, you will have this uniform language spoken to your pathologist also. So you'll talk about aceto whiteness, margins, vessels, lesion size, iodine staining with 0, 1, and 2, and total score is 10. So I brought for you a few cases like, you know, let's understand this is thin aceto whiteness. So I put one for uh, uh, color, one for because jagged margin, I put one. So one plus one, then these are fine mosaics and punctations, so it's zero. And then it is there in two quadrants, so I put as one. And my, you can see Lugol's is patchy variegated one. So the total becomes four. And when you do a biopsy, it is CIN one. Now understanding Swede is whenever there is zero, one is a typical, two, three, and four is CIN one. It's, it's like, you know, 
it, it, but the CIN reports have to be given by pathologist. You as a colposcopist can say it's a low grade CIN, below four is low grade and above four, five and above is high grade. But to make it more simpler, five, six, seven becomes SIN2 and eight, nine, ten is SIN3. These are all into studies. But for us to make understanding, you will not tell CIN1, 2 and 3. You will say low grade or high grade depending upon the score. And again, you will wait for the uh, report of histopathology. Then again, over here, this has been total uh, done into 8, 7, 8, and histopath came out to be SIN2. This has been totaled to, you can see over here. So because of the lack of time, I'm going a little faster. Uh, so this has been totaled to 8 and the histopath has come to SIN3. Only one thing which I want to come over here is we have to take a biopsy from SCJ that has to be covered. And then we have over here is our invasive CA where we can see over here dense, chalky white, and you can see abnormal blood vessel pattern. You can see a rich sign, inner border sign, all these are there. When we talk about invasive CA, you can see there's all different type of uh, patterns of abnormal blood vessel patterns, which I told you with a mustard staining, this all came out to be total 10, and the histopath was invasive CA. Now, whenever we are talking about uh, colposcopy, we also have to remember adenocarcinoma. It's not always squamous carcinoma. That's again, we have to remember. So you can see over here, how do you identify? Why can't this be a metaplasia? Why is it called a lesion? It's because of the denseness. It's a dense acetovitness. It is not transparent. It's not translucent. It's going endocervical. And it's that chalky white and it's coming up with, uh, uh, with a mustard yellow. And you can see over here, abnormal blood vessel patterns so whenever in in the uh, this thing you know the third fourth column is your size so the size is whenever there is an endocervical grow uh, it goes endocervical we give two that's very important so this is histopath is adenocarcinoma in c2 now coming up to the instruments this is the last part of my talk because i've been given two talks to club up so now whenever you're talking about instruments the instruments should be uh, the your trolley should be full. That's one thing very, very important. It shouldn't happen that I do not have this as started, but oh, my SCJ is inside, you know, it's gone into TZ3. I do not have an endocervical speculum. I can't see a growth inside. Just don't do without proper instrumentation. Please do not start your colposcopy examination. That's an advice from my end. So what, what is the basic instruments do you require? You require a sponge holder, Various types of, um, sorry for that. Yeah, various types of uh, different types of cuspos, uh, endocervical speculum, endocervical curatage, tissue biopsy forceps. You should have your um, uh, bowels ready for, you know, all your acetic acid, normal saline and lugols. And you can have a, a pair of gloves and uh, uh, whenever you're taking any histopath for that. So now another thing is a very practical thing is whenever there is, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, lax vagina, many times we see that we have a problem with that vaginal walls coming up. So do, if you can use this condoms uh, with this cut with that, you know, uh, the tip, you can use this as a vaginal wall retractor. You should have different types of speculum. This is again a, a biopsy forceps. This is a endocervical uh, speculum. This is an endocervical curate. Now, this is an, these are few specialized instruments which I use in my practice because we are referral centers and we get cases from Pan India, all different, different types of cases we get. So we do have to have the instruments which are truly suiting uh, the, the right diagnosis. So even this have we have been using for uh, you know vaginal retraction. This is one instrument which I have uh, designed and it has got patency. Now, this is what I've done is because it's many a times whenever you're taking a specular biopsy or whenever you are to take a let's and all, you will see the cervix moving up and down, you know. You're trying to press it, it's going up. So you have to have to fix it up. How do you fix up a cervix? You cannot use tinaculum because it is very sharp and then that gets, you know, uh, cut through also. So we do require an automatic insulated. Uh, so, and, and I made it insulated so that it's very easy to hold. This had been uh, showcased. It had been, it had come into the uh, yearbook of Foxy um, in, in that uh, chapter of doctors who have designed their own instruments. Then this has some bags also we had designed, which gives us the mobility to take the instruments. Uh, 
I'll, I'll, I got one case for you all. This was my recent case. This case was, it had come from uh, Jaunpur to Mumbai. This case is a 55 year old. She had a pap of LSIL and she was spotting PV. Why, why I brought this case is to make you all understand the importance of instruments and how important it is to have the right spec, spec instruments with you. She's spotting PV while taking a pap. And at Jaunpur at uh, UP, they were told uh, to do a hysterectomy. And uh, it was the case was very confusing. So, so she was told by some doctor out there to come to Mumbai at my place. So colposcopy report was done, but it was not shared. It was all very, very, you know, uh, shady. It wasn't, no, nobody has shared any right report. So they had come with all the hopes as a final hope to Sainivas, to our center at Mumbai. Now, when I put a cuscos, I found a complete deceptive look and it was so difficult to understand where the cervix is also for that matter. If you can see over here, which is a cervical opening and what is it? Everything is so confused. So you, you're not, and this is not the cervix. But believe me, friends, this is just a fold on the vagina. So it was all so deceptive. I told first you go for a uh, go for a sonography and come. And even in the sonography, it was showed the cervix is so flush with the vaginal vault that you are not able to, you know, take a biopsy. There comes the instruments. So I called her back. I said, let me use my spec designed instruments for me to understand how to take up the biopsy. Because the main thing was they were so, so worried that they wanted that biopsy. And that's the reason they had come over there. So what I'd done was I didn't now put any of the speculum. I just put this vaginal wall retractor. I pushed this whole thing. And I could finally get that uh, os, uh, which I could put it up with this, um, you know, our uh, uterine sound. And I could... I'd ultimately understand where the cervix is. And then this is the instrument which I'm using. This is an automatic instrument, so it's not having any problem. And this is a small bit of cervix which is there. The other things are all flushed. So then taking a biopsy and uh, then we did a vaginal colposcopy on her as well. So these are the special set of instruments which was used in this case. And the histopath, luckily, came out to be a sign of chronic cervicitis specific, nothing much, because they were worried for that L cell and this is an old age and touching had bleeding and all that stuff. Finally, we could come out with that understanding that no problem, you can go back and get your, uh, just evaluate it every five years and all that. So we could say that to her in the proper fashion, her HPV was also negative, LBC came out to be a negative. So thank you very much, dear friends. Our uh, colposcopy and understanding, it is not only colposcopy, it is the understanding of the whole subject. From empirical, we have come to evidence-based, we have HPV test, we have LBC, we do have proper colposcopy, we can have an alternative ending. I brought more, all my, these things are from my own test book. Um, we have been doing a lot of this training, teaching programs. So let us join hands together for India, uh, for India, Cervical Cancer Free India. Thank you very much for patient hearing. Thank you, ma'am. It was indeed a great learning session for all of us. Thank you. Uh, next, may I now request Dr. S.K. Giri, sir, for his session. I welcome, sir. Uh, he is a professor in PG Department of Gynecologic Oncology in ASP GIC Kandak. He has organized many national and international conferences in gynecologic oncology. He is a surgical faculty in many gynecological oncology life operation workshop across the country. He is a member of guideline committee of ICMR National Cancer Grid, member of NBE for gynecologic oncology. He has many publications, more than 50 national and international publications, contributed chapters in boxy books and focuses and other books. MCA is examiner in gynecologic oncology. His special interests are preventive gynecologic oncology, valvular reconstruction surgery, radical surgery in gynec cancer. Sir, please welcome. Thank you very much. So should I be allowed to share my screen? Very good afternoon, everybody. Am I, am I audible now? Yes, sir. Okay. You are audible. So, uh, uh, at, at the outset, I, I, I beg apology to uh, Dr. Lila and Dr. Sima because I am, I am pushing in because of some urgent work with, uh, which is there with me. So, uh, so this is getting from uh, state of uh, uh, Lord Gadana. So, my topic is uh, colonization. So, we are spending much of time. We know the high grade lesions of the cervix are managed by mostly by excisional biases or ablative, ablative therapy. 
and cold lime colonization systems or you, the, the short term is CKC is the exergeron therapy and is now very, very infrequently used because of leap on layers has almost replaced it. But still it is its own place. So what are the places? When this fungal junction is deep in the cervical canal, yes. And upper end is not seen. Upper end exits more than one centimeter in the cervical canal is beyond the external capacity of the loop. Yes, we can go for, with recent advances, we can go with the deeper, the, the big loops can be used here. But it is difficult uh, to take the uh, deeper cervical canal. And there is a disparity in cytology and pulposcopy. A typical granular cells on cytology, yes, there is a role of uh, um, this is CKC. Or when there is suspicion of microinvasions and endosophical keratosis reveals abnormal histology, or there is a persistent or recurrent CN after leap or ablations. So, external procedure is, uh, is done by uh, cold line, it is, it is by scalpel, it's called cold line of colonizations. And uh, this is very important therapeutic options for mostly CIN. And it is both diagnostic and therapeutic. What this diagnosis and management of HSIL and therapeutic also in HSIL and stage one A1 disease without, without LVAC, one can for conservative management can be done. And what are the types of colonization? You know very much. Is it there may be laser colonization? There may be cold life colonization. There may be others like uh, a leap and ledge, which is nowadays we are we are, we are putting together leap and ledge in, into one one terminology. And my topic here today is the cold life colonization. So. Uh, so, what are the different methodology? That is more or less cone separate tissue is, is excised by this colonization. This is either by laser or electrosurgical wear or scalpel. But laser is expensive and needs a lot of expertise. And electrosurgical wear is effective in hemostasis, which is now commonly practiced. Both laser and electrosurgical wear has results in some thermal artifact which is now uh, is encountered. And margin interpretation becomes a little difficult, but it is not that, in, that, that significant as it is thought to be. However, cone biopsy specimen can be large and deep. It can be well oriented and has a better chance of clear margin. So, uh, colposcopy examination has to be done with HTKC and local cyanidin. So, to localize the uh, transposition zone, it may be done under anesthesia. That may be local anesthesia, that may be regional, that may be GA, as, as patients desire. And is 1.5 to 2 ml of person can with adrenaline 1 and 1 lakh. To be installed into uh, 12, 2, 3, 6, 8, and 10 occult positions, around total is 9 to 10 ml, which causes blanching. I will show in the video. The lateral sutures are placed at 3 and 9 occult positions, but we do not know the efficacy. It is usually customary to put on it in the in the uh, thought that the hope that it may reduce the bleeding. Endospherical canal is sounded and direction of to know the direction and depth of excision. Fractional curator is performed to exclude disease in the upper upper endoservice, and accordingly we plan for excision. And excision are done at with 11 or 15 uh, scalpel blade and start from 6 o'clock position, not from 12 o'clock positions. Because if you go for from 6 o'clock positions, from 12 person, the bleeding, etc., will obscure the obscure our um, the, the lower part of the surface. We cannot do proper uh, proper excisions. And granular abnormality is found. So one should go for a deep into surface, and most of the cervical canal can should be or some sometimes need to be excised. And lesion in the lesion in the exo service of the young woman, who which are yet to conceive or plan for next pregnancy, you should one should take the wide but not the deep cones required because there is chance of problem of uh, that is uh, premature premature labor. There may be infertility, cervical incompetence. All things can come. And and the specimen should be removed intact. Should be better desirable to in, uh, to remove in one piece. And, and there should be, they, you know, it should take at 12 o'clock or 6 o'clock position for proper orientation by pathologist. One should tag it. So a minimal bleeding, if there's a minimal bleeding, one can cauterize with a ball cautery. And cone bed is left to granulate by itself. So that uh, after healing, you see, you can heal, it's very nice, visible squamical junctions is visible. If bleeding a little more, one can do surgery cells. One can use whether one cell solution, some one cell paste can be used. One can use vaginal pack. And transmission can be also be used. If bleeding is again more, one should go for suture running circumferentially around the surface is called baseball stick sutures. It will, it will shown in my, my video there. And one can do stern rope suture, which you do in further will repair. But here the more the demerit is this squamacolon junction is not seen after it is healed. So this is the video you can see. Uh, uh, here, here the surface is visualized there. And uh, what, what, what I'm going to do is that install, install the uh, 
leg nokan and uh, it is a 12 o'clock 2 o'clock 3 o'clock 5 o'clock all things you can see seven eight places one can install it just do the branching has to be there you can see the branching is there branching is nicely visualized and uh, so so uh, once once branching is there then we can think of uh, uh, ligating on this <coughs> lateral cervical uh, lateral um, descending descending vessels of cervix and now you can see I'm, I'm putting a little bit deep, deep, deep bites should be taken so that at least we can we can obscure the vessels which is supplying to the cervix. And uh, uh, as, as I told, it, it, it may not be very effective, but yes, it, is, it becomes customary just to prevent, it, it may prevent uh, uh, the more bleeding from the cervix. So both sides, it has to be done from three o'clock and nine o'clock position. And uh, after that is, that is done, we should, uh, that is a, there is a deep uh, deep suture is given on this is on on the right side of the uh, patient and now now you can see we just just we can sounding it and just you can see that i i'm i'm putting the putting this uh, knife from the uh, uh, six six of the positions this is a uh, this is a 15 number blade and this is a on um, from 16 number uh, and putting from six of the position and it is going from uh, one side from uh, from from down to the on the left side to anteriorly then I'm going to cut the a cone separate tissue has to be removed. And uh, it depending upon situations, whether you need a big uh, large cone or you like to uh, do a small cone, depending upon the region size, one can think of going for a, a, a resemble of the cones. And uh, as, uh, uh, as, as, as it is um, thought that it, it bleeds a lot, it does not bleed a lot at all. It does not bleed a lot. And if you do it, all this precautionary measure is given. It, it does not does not bleed a lot. And uh, the, now you can just one one it is there. The, the cone cone separate tissue is now removed. And one uh, here one should put the so this this is the mark so that one the pathologist will know where uh, orient orient the tissue. Then what happens? What happens? The bleeding is very less now. So I am I am trying to give the ball cutter uh, cutter has to be given, put put over here. And ball cutry, just for this demonstration, I'm, I'm going to give everything, almost everything here. Now, one ball cutry it does not help. One can one can go for a uh, that is the uh, suture that is a uh, you can see the suture. It may be underpinning sutures or baseball stick sutures can be put on for. Now you can see the, the, there is no much of breeding, but I'm just for the demonstration purpose. I'm I'm putting this uh, this is this baseball stick sutures, which is a, is a continuous circumferential running suture. Inside the uh, cervical canal, so that the bleeding does not occur more. And accordingly, we come from one side to other side and complete the circle. The cir this is this is called circum circumferentially. Uh, it should be uh, put in. I usually uh, I, I put it. So I give in a uh, one zero thirty mm uh, or one thirty mm uh, cutting needle. It becomes a good to put it in the in the cutting needle. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult to because it's a hard and very tough tissue tissue over here. So you can see I'm I'm going from now two other positions over here, and 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 now almost it is almost uh, I'm going to almost complete of the suture is there. So now now it is there. So there is the, the bleeding is almost controlled, and. Uh, now we, we can just to for the demonstration we can we can put uh, this is surgery cell you know what is surgery cell surgery cell is a cellulose uh, like a net this surgery cell can be put on this is this is for the demonstration it is not required always we can we can put the surgery cell it is a, it is a hemostatic uh, gel like structure so it can be put uh, uh, in the in the service to this, uh, prevent much of bleeding and it it helps it helps to to great extent it helps it, it helps in a uh, prevention of bleeding and it also stops bleeding also if it is there. So, so after that is there. Uh, so you, 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 the the service looks like this. This is the this is the uh, once you do so to this is excision procedure. Then the service look, after the healing it looks like this. So now what the result is? Success rate is ninety to ninety four percent. And margin clearance is clear. There is the risk of recurrence is around less than one percent. And complications are hemorrhages at zero two percent. It occurs in the first 20, twenty-four hours to ten to twelve days of postoperative. And cervical stenosis can occur up to three percent. 
and uh, uh, so the difference from CKC and LEAP is the specimen interpretation, interpretable surgical margin is 95 percent, whereas in LEAP there is around 85 percent. Margin involvement is 13 to 16 percent, where it is there in 22 to 38 percent. And a single intact specimen is possible in CKC, but it may, it, it may not always be possible in uh, LEAP procedures. And uh, so, but one should try to have a single surgical solution for better, better pathological uh, interpretations. But CKC is preferred when there is margin status is critical, such as granular lesions or suspected microinvasions. One should go for CKC. And CKC, if uh, adenocarcinoma C2 after LEAP is there, so one should go for a CKC. So, pregnancy rate is uh, almost the same, but there is a preterm labor is more in preterm labor and low birth is more in CKC than in LEAP. LEAP around 6%. But uh, in uh, CKC, 15 to 20 percent. And uh, this depends on size of cone. And if size of cone is bigger, then uh, the premature labor and uh, uh, things are very common, very easy, very, very early. So, ability procedures are associated with fewer complications and less adverse obstetric outcomes. Otherwise, uh, the CKC has got a uh, really real complications are there. So, let us let come to an end. CKC is now an infrequent procedures after ad advent of leap. Yes, it is not commonly practiced. It needs a little bit of anesthesia, all things are there, but LIP can be practiced with local anesthesia. And definite place in, but there is a, it's a definite place in when a very strong colon junction is deep. It has gone deep into cervical canal. When there is granular lesions and suspected microinvasion is there in either you go for a colposcopy or go down there is a microinvasion suspected is there. So one should think of going for a CKC, then going for a, going for a LIP. And there is, it's a good in management of HSL and stage one A1 digits without LPSA. And CKC has a large specimen than LIP for better pathologic, pathologic evaluations. Complications are slightly more than LIP. Definitely, complications are more. Bleeding is more. Uh, the, um, the pregnancy rate, uh, those, those almost same. There is a chance of premature labor, low birth baby. And both excisions or ablations, the outcome as to efficacy is comparable. But choice of modality depends on severity and size of the lesions, desire for pregnancy and training of surgeons, and ability to equipment. If I'm good at uh, doing, doing surgery, I should go for CKC. I'm good at doing LIP, yes, but LIP also practice LIP because it, it, is, a, it is a less uh, invasive procedure. But uh, CKC should not be a dying art. It needs a practice, and, but regular follow-up is always required. Thank you very much for present this night. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now, may I request Dr. Partha Basu, sir, uh, to speak on treatment with thermal ablation. Uh, he is the head of the screening group. He is accredited to the International Agency for Research on Cancer, WHO Lion Friends. He's, uh, he has received awards on Commonwealth Fellowship, UICC, YY Memorial International Cancer Study Fellowship. UICC ICRET Fellowship, CSIR India Technology Excellency Award, Silver Medal and Honors in Surgery from Kolkata University. Please welcome, sir. Yeah, Dr. Pinaki, it was a little issue. He could not join. So okay. uh, can I share my screen so that... Uh... Yes, ma'am. Is the audio clear? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear the audio? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear the audio of the video? That is Audio we can hear, ma'am, but video is not visible now. Okay, okay, okay. Let me first show you the bench talk. Okay, okay. So this is the one which we uh, call WISAP thermoparameter. As you can see, this is connected to the main, sir, and it, it, it needs uh, a running electricity. Yeah, yeah, please give me a minute. I'll share again. Good afternoon. Mom, you need to select directly the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Discuss a very important topic. That is I have to start this one first and then share screen. Yes, ma'am. This is just. A
Good afternoon. At the outset, I thank Boxy for uh, giving me the opportunity to discuss a very important topic that is thermal ablation to treat cervical premarital conditions. Let me first show you the bench top. Right? Yes, ma'am. Now it's visible. So this is the one which we uh, call WISAP thermocoagulator. As you can see, this is connected to the mains uh, and it, it needs uh, uh, running electricity. So, and then this is the front of the machine. There is a button to switch on the machine. So as we press the button, we can see that there is a display here. So this display is showing the temperature that will be achieved at the tip of the probe. And there is a knob here that you can control to make sure that the temperature is stabilized at 100 degrees centigrade. So that is the first thing we need to do when we work with the machine. So the machine is now set at 100 degrees centigrade. Now, what does that mean? So this is the thermal ablation probe. And when we set the temperature at 100 degrees centigrade, this is the probe tip. The probe tip uh, gets heated up to 100 degrees centigrade. Now here, if you, when you look at the probe tip closely, you can see this is flat, smooth, non-stick. And this is the, uh, the uh, 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 surface that touches on the transformation zone of the cervix. The, as I say, the temperature required is 100 degrees centigrade and the time required to treat is 30 seconds. So every time I press this uh, probe on the cervix, it should be there for 30 seconds. And please remember that this probe can be reapplied. Say for example, if there is a large transformation zone, and with the, first, with, the, with the first application, I'm not being able to cover the full transformation zone because the, the diameter of this probe is limited. It is 15 millimeter diameter. But then I can treat and then move it to another uh, part of the transformation zone and again retreat. So this is what we call overlapping reapplications. And reapplication is possible up to five times. But then 90% of the lesions are treated with two applications. At the most, some of the women will require three applications. But then multiple overlapping application is feasible with thermal ablation. So this is the, uh, about the, uh, the, the benchtop variety. Now, this is the other machine. As you can see, this is much smaller, much more portable. And this is uh, a, a Liger thermal ablator. And this also has a probe. As you can see, this is the probe which I, I have attached to the machine. And this comes with a rechargeable battery. So once this battery is fully charged, uh, the machine can treat about 20 women. So it does not require a, a, a live you know, electricity connection. That's a huge advantage for the, uh, the limited resource settings. Now. Uh, the, the, the technique of treatment. How do we do it? So the woman should be appropriately counseled. She should be in the lying down condition with the, either the legs flexed or the legs can be uh, uh, put on stirrups in a lithotomy position. The cervix should be properly exposed. It's always a good um, uh, practice to apply lugal saline so that the transformation zone and the lesions, they're very nicely delineated. So once the, so the, so the transformation zone is seen, then you make sure that the machine is switched on and then, the, uh, uh, then hold this, the probe like this, what you call pin holding grip, and then gradually go inside the vagina. Now here is a word of caution. This probe tip it gets uh, the, you know, heated in a few seconds. So when you are going in, it's already hot. So be careful not to touch the lateral vaginal wall. And once you go in and directly put the place, uh, sorry, put the probe in the middle of the transformation zone. See, this is what I have done. So right at the middle of the transformation zone, you may require multiple applications, but first application should always be at the center. So keep it there for 30 seconds. Then if you want to uh, cover another area, you can always move the probe and then uh, make another multi uh, another overlapping application. 
So keep it there for 30 seconds. Now here is the important thing. There is no local anesthetic required. No injection, no local anesthetic is required for doing this uh, uh, treatment because we are treating the ectocervix, which has very few nerve endings. And the treatment time is only 30 seconds. So we don't, don't no, no anesthetic is required. Now, once the uh, treatment is done, then you have to take it out the probe. Again, be careful not to touch the lateral vaginal wall. Once the treatment is done, the, uh, take out the speculum, make the woman comfortable, it's the time to counsel her. Now, there are a few things we have to tell the woman. First and foremost thing is that she will, uh, you know, have a, a little bit of watery vaginal discharge that may be a little bit blood tinged, uh, that may, may, may be there for a week, but then she should not get unnecessarily worried. This is expected. We need to tell her. We need to tell her that uh, she should abstain from sex for four weeks. Uh, th this is to avoid, you know, the, 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 any injury to the raw cervix and then giving enough time for the epithelium to heal. No antibiotics required. Some of the women may uh, require a paracetamol tablet on the same night or, or the next day. Now, important thing is, when do we recall the woman? We <clears throat> recall the woman usually after uh, four to six weeks. Uh, in Indian setting, most of the time when we do this uh, ablative treatment, we take the punch biopsy. And this is the time to review the punch biopsy report. If the punch biopsy report is not invasive cancer, the woman should be reassured and should be asked to come back after one year only. If the punch biopsy report is invasive cancer, of course, the woman needs appropriate management for that. And at that visit, uh, at four weeks uh, or six weeks, do not do any speculum examination, no screening, no colposcopy. All screening or colposcopy should be done only when the woman comes back after one year. So the post-treatment follow-up will be after one year when we can either do an HPV test, VIA test, cytology, or even direct colposcopy. So that's how we, we, we uh, follow up these women after treatment. The treatment is extremely efficacious. We have uh, seen in a randomized control study that is ongoing in Zambia that uh, thermal ablation, cryotherapy, or loop excision, they perform equally well in curing the cervical precancer lesions. And there have been meta-analysis of studies that have shown even for treating CIN3 lesions, it is the cure rate for thermal ablation is almost as high as 90%. So it's a, it's a very effective, it's a very safe uh, 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 treatment. Now, one important thing that I uh, like to tell you is that once the treatment is done, you need to understand or you need to uh, you know, uh, advise your nurse about the disinfection. So what do we do for disinfection? Uh, the first and foremost thing to be disinfected is the probe. So this probe, as you can see here, it can be taken, uh, re, uh, you know, taken out and the probe should be clean, especially the surface of, uh, of, the, of the tip uh, with, a, with clean detergent water, uh, uh, sorry, clean water with a detergent. One can use a soft brush to remove any biological material. So once that is cleaned with uh, the soap and uh, water, then uh, well, you know it ha has to be dried up. Now one word of caution, the water should not get into the back end of the probe. You can see that there are, this is, there's a metal tip here and uh, this side, you know, one should, should we, we do not want water to seep in. So for this, there is actually a, a cap that we can put inside, uh, sorry, we can put on. So you can see for this, there is a cap. So when we clean with water, we put the cap at the back. Now, once that it is clean, the probe, including the teeth, should be wiped with alcohol to decontaminate. Once that is done, then this probe has to be put in a tall glass or any kind of container that has Sidex solution. So have Sidex solution, enough of it, to at least uh, you know, uh, uh, reach up to the upper uh, level of the probe. It, the probe need not be immersed in the uh, uh, Cydex solution, but then should be kept, uh, you know, dipped in the Cydex solution. How long do we do that? We do that for 20 minutes. So, and then once it is kept for 20 minutes, it can be taken out. Then again, it, it, it can be rinsed in clean water, dried, and then can be reused. So that is the procedure for uh, disinfection. And I'll show you now a sh short video. 
of the of the procedure being done. As you can see here, the probe has already been applied on the cervix. Now, here you can appreciate that we have, this is a lesion that is not, that cannot be covered by a single application. That the lesion is extending around 11 o'clock position. You can see from 11 o'clock position, we have taken a biopsy, so you can see the raw uh, area there. But then we can make, you know, cover that in the second application. So we have put the probe right at the center of the cervix. As you, as the, the thermal ablation uh, continues, you can see those kind of bubbles coming up. So that is very typical uh, to, uh, you know, that uh, uh, tells us that the, uh, you know, treatment is going on. Another very important thing with thermal ablation is that it is very good at stopping the bleeding uh, uh, that, that happens after taking biopsy. Supposing you have taken a biopsy and then you don't have to, you are planning to go for a thermal ablation. You don't have to use any other cauterizing material. You simply uh, go ahead and do the thermal ablation. Now you can see after 30 seconds of uh, uh, treatment, how nicely the entire transformation zone uh, has been treated, but we still have to treat the area which is there around 11 o'clock position. So just adjust the speculum a little bit and then reapply the probe then make sure this time the probe covers the area that you are, are trying to treat, but then don't worry about overlapping of, um, over the area that was initially treated. That is how we need to do. We need to make overlapping application. And again, the second application, or if you go for a third application, will be for the same duration, that is for 30 seconds. And once it is uh, done, just make sure that you take out the probe uh, 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 correctly. And thank you so much for your patient listening. Uh, Dr. Seema? Yeah, yeah. Thank uh, you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Now, uh, without any further delay, we would like to have a very important talk for the day today. And the talk is by none other than Dr. Nija Bhatla, ma'am. She'll be talking on prevalence of cancer cervix in Northeast. And Dr. Nija Bhatla needs no introduction. She's, she is the head of the department, Citrix and Gynecology, Ames, New Delhi, and chief NCI Gyne Oncology. And uh, ma'am is a well-known name in the field of cervical cancer prevention. It is her efforts that we all are, you know, kind of heading towards the, our aim and are making all those efforts. So over to you, ma'am. Good evening. Thank you for the invitation to be here today. And I will be making my presentation about the burden cancer prevalence in northeast can you see my screen yes ma'am we can yes. see us yes okay thank you so uh, so you know i think everybody is very well aware about the data from Globocan and how much is the burden of disease in the lower middle income countries. Now, this is a recent uh, publication that has come from uh, the National Cancer Registry Program, which looks at 28 population-based registries in India. It's under the ICMR, and it looks at these registries from different regions and zones. So they have seen a wide variety of uh, a wide variation in women's cancers and the highest proportions in West and followed by the South. And in fact, breast cancer was leading in 11 of the registries. It's currently the number one cancer we know. But if we look at the cervical cancer incidence, we see that mostly it is the rural registries which are showing the higher incidences. So we have the highest ones coming and all all the blue ones are registries in the Northeast. So we can see that there is again a very wide variety, variation. If we see the Brugar district has the lowest and Papumpare has the highest amongst all the registries, but there is a definitely a lot more in the uh, Northeast area there. And then this uh, is the next bunch coming up here. So these are all above the 
uh, target of four per hundred thousand, which is our goal in the Northeast. In fact, some time ago, the ICMR had also compiled the profile of cancer and related health indicators in the Northeast region of India, again, through this national uh, NCDIR, this was the crude incidence rate of all the cancers together that they had put together in uh, the various parts of the country. And uh, you can see that the ones which have the indicators like light blue have the lower incidences and the ones which have the pinkish ones have the higher incidences. And there has been per se an increase. If we look over the period of time, we definitely see that the rate of cancers has increased in the whole country and even Northeast is not left behind, even though many of these in the yellow are obviously still better than what it is there. There've also been some individual publications which have looked at the descriptive epidemiology of common female cancers, this hospital-based uh, study from uh, the uh, from Dr. Ketki's uh, unit had shown that there was the highest prevalence with the breast cancer, and you can see the age distribution of these also. Then you have the uterine cervix, and you have the ovarian. So uh, these are the main cancers being seen, but there is a need for improvement of female education and population-based intervention because both the blue and the red can definitely be sorted. So high burden of the disease, very limited resources, survival rate comparatively low, higher proportion of distant metastasis at diagnosis, and these uh, uh, high age-adjusted incidence rates were seen in many of these inhabitants. And risk factors which have been seen in Northeast include tobacco, betel nuts, foods which are high in spices and chilies, and several hot beverages which, uh, which contribute to other cancers like esophageal cancers, et cetera. So if we see the tobacco use among the Indian states, we find that there is quite a bit of consumption, whether we look at the National Family Health Survey or we look at the Global Adult Tobacco Survey, particularly Mizoram, Sikkim, and all we are seeing quite high rates. Now, the risk factors for breast cancer are like late pregnancies and obesity. We know the cervical cancer, the lack of hygiene, practice of multiple partners, general lack of hygiene have been implicated, and stomach cancer, the dietary habits. But the lack of screening and treatment options is a very overriding and universally prevalent concern. This is the breast cancer, a triple negative cancer, which is seen again in patients in Northeast India. There have been studies, I think, particularly from Tripura, Guwahati, which have shown this one from Guwahati showed. And that shows also the need perhaps at some point to look at some hereditary patterns as well. And the lack of infrastructure is of course also overwhelming, which is not necessarily confined to the region, but this is the picture that emerges of how many district hospitals, cancer treating hospitals, radiotherapy facilities, cancer patient welfare schemes, and palliative centers are there. And you can see what is the uh, shortfall lying over there. This is where we are with the population-based cancer registries marked with a cross, the hospital-based registries with an H, and those where there are some PBCR data, but they may not have figured in this report. And the report that they have produced has been based upon these, where they pick up either from a specified geographical location, or they pick up all the malignant cases which are reporting to a particular hospital. And then they take it from each and every department over there. In case of population-based registries, they take it from all the hospitals, private clinics, laboratory services, death certificates, screening programs. So a lot actually depends on how assiduously this is done by the persons who are collecting the data, because a lot will depend on their diligence and their sincerity to follow this meticulously and compile it. Like this is the story really with all data really. So these are the type of uh, population profiles that these uh, registries are covering. They're very variable in the amount of area they cover, but and the population that they service. And definitely we don't have as many as we should, but there are some registries which work even outside of the NCDIR uh, network. 
So this is not all, but this is what ICMR is capturing and the total number of cancer cases. So this is the situation, for example, uh, in the Mizoram uh, thing, you have age adjusted rate, 271 cancer cases per males and 249 uh, per females in Azol and Papumpare, respectively in uh, Mizoram and Arunachal. Then there's an AR incidence of 206 per 100,000 males and 174 per 100,000 females in Kamrup. Now, this is definitely higher than the national average of 80 to 100 cases. And the five-year survival rate, it has been pointed out, is just 40% compared with 74% for the rest of India. So this is also sad. And really, it's truly when we go out for cancer prevention work, we should not necessarily confine ourselves to the one because we know that there is a national common cancer screening program which is looking at breast, cervix, and oral cancers, and we should really be looking at all of these. So this is, for example, the data which is coming out of the various states regarding the number of cancer cases registered, the leading cancer sites in males, the esophagus, lung, stomach, hypopharynx, mouth, in females, it is breast, cervix, uterine, gallbladder, esophagus, and lung. So if you look at the probability of one number of persons developing cancer in the zero to 74 years age group, and you can see that it varies depending upon which uh, uh, registry we are picking up. And you can see that what is the probability of developing any site cancer varies from the Kamrup showing the lower incidence to the Manipur state showing the higher incidence and Tripura showing even higher among the females in this report. And uh, this is the result, uh, the leading cases according to the pooled analysis. So in males, the highest is uh, uh, for the esophagus is one in 54, mouth is one in 145 for the females. It is one in 76 for the breast and it is one in 123 for the gallbladder. So it is a variable incidence we are seeing. But if you see the clinical extent at the time of diagnosis for the selected anatomic sites, you can see in the blue, the ones which are localized only, the yellow for the local regional and the distant metastasis. So you can see that when it, you look at lung, you see the majority are with the distant metastasis already in a category and in cervix uteri and breast and in head and neck and in stomach. In all the others, it is the local regional spread and the number who present with localized only is really not as good a fraction as it could be for cancers that are preventable. And this is the median age at cancer diagnosis in males, which is 56 years for esophagus and 58 years for hypopharynx. And in females, it's really, really young. The median age is breast 47 years and cervix uteri 49 years. So they say for years of life lost are really higher for cervical cancer than they are for many other cancers. And this is a double tragedy because it is a preventable cancer. So here again, you can see these age adjusted rates by the all sites and by this uh, thing, which I've already discussed with you regarding the latest data for the cervical cancer and going by the projected number of cases, which is likely to increase. It's an astronomical number that we are seeing it rising every five years and it's going to be higher and higher burden. And it is really the high time that we put the services in place because already if we are feeling that they are insufficient, they are going to be even more insufficient as the years go by and as we see these expanding number of cases. The likely increase in total number of cases will be 13.5% by 2025. So then we can see as we go by each state, what is the ASR and what is the number of new cases and what is the screening done? And it is a very low proportion of women who are getting screened for breast cancer oral cancer and cervical cancer. And universally in all the districts where these national common program has been started, it is typically the same that in oral, they will say it is highest because they will say, open your mouth and show, which is the easiest. And then it will vary in some, the breast will be more where again, there are reports that may or may not have properly examined. We have only asked whether you have a lump in your breast, but a good clinical breast examination may or may not be done. 
but usually cervical is actually at the rock bottom. In this case, in Arunachal, they're saying 8.5%, and the mortality incidence ratio is 21.9% in best uh, Arunachal, as you can see here, and it is <clears throat> coming to 20.2% in Pasighat. And if you see in Assam, you can see here the number of cases in females and males. And here you can see that the screening rates are really, really low, like not even 1% for any of the cases as per the records. And the mortalities overall is all in the same range. And this is a little bit less in Kachar, it is 17.6, but all the others are broadly in the 20s. In Manipur, again, you can see the age group and you can see the sharp increase with the age in these people. And here again, the screening rates are very, very low. And surprisingly, the oral cancer screening is less than the cervical cancer. May speak well of the programs being done even on research footing in Manipur, which have been taken very well, I think, by their people. And the Meghale, it is again, the same patterns are there. But again, you see the screening level done very, very low. And here the MI ratio is like 39%. And Mizoram, you find the uh, MI ratios are hitting 48%, 50%. And again, you see the screening done very low, cervical cancer here at 6.9%. And this one for Mizoram has come again. Nagaland, Nagaland, you can see here that you have uh, the mortality incidence little better, although the screening done is also low. So it's not exactly very clear why they, uh, how they are managing to get a lower MI ratio. But this is the thing with the data, you have to go into the deeper details to find out what are the reasons. Here you see in Sikkim, it is such a low prevalence of the screening and 48% MI ratio. Tripura, it is a very high MI ratio you're seeing again, screening is very poor. So the ways for cancer uh, prevention and control are not a one track thing. This is one thing we're trying to emphasize through the project that we have to interlink. We have to interlink all the stakeholders because only then is it going to be effective. <laughs> Excuse me. So the risk reduction strategies of promoting awareness for no tobacco use, no alcohol, eating healthy diet, physical activity, appropriate vaccinations, hepatitis B, HPV, then early detection to comply with treatment, seek prompt advice, participate in cancer screening activities, but not at all going to be manageable till there is a change in policy and program. So the strengthening of health systems, ensuring universal health coverage, coverage, community empowerment, multi-sectoral actions, and health promotion are all integral to finding ways of cancer prevention and control on a sustainable basis. So in conclusion, the cases diagnosed at localized stage are lower. Screening program needs to be strengthened and extensively carried out at community mm -hmm. level. The childhood cancer rate incidence are the lowest in this region. We don't know why. A multidisciplinary approach by introducing appropriate cancer prevention and control programs, which include upgrading existing infrastructure and providing specialized uh, care, should be employed. So, uh, with that, I will stop my presentation here. If there are any comments, I would be happy to see them. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for such a wonderful presentation, such an informative um, presentation. And do we have some questions in the chat box? No, ma'am, there are none. So, so we can, now can we go ahead with the second talk, ma'am? Next talk by Dr. Leela Digumarti. Leela, ma'am, are you there? Yes. Dr. Leela Digumarti is a gynae oncologist at Kim yeah. Zaiken Hospital, Vishakha Patnam. She's president ICCP. She's certified colposcopy trainer by ISCCP. She is member ISCCP, Foxy, Egoi, IMS, ISOPAB, IGCS, and ESCO. She's a DNB teacher and examiner for more than a decade. Organizing secretary, ISCCP 2019 National Conference at WISAC. And since 2014, with several NGOs creating awareness, vaccination, and screening for cervical cancer with regular camps in North Andhra. 
She's a master trainer in uh, several colposcopy workshops across India. So over to you, ma'am. We look forward to hear from you about cryo cryotherapy treatment of for cervical precancer. Yeah, thank you very much for a nice introduction, Dr. Seema Singhal. Uh, good evening, faculty and the participants. So let me share my screen now. Yeah, is it uh, visible, my screen? Yes, ma'am, it is visible. Yeah. yeah. So after understanding uh, so much about uh, uh, diagnosis of cervical precancer uh, using colposcopy and also understanding the problem, what is there in the northeastern states, which was very nicely shown by Dr. Mirja Bhatla. So we are again back to the treatment and already the two treatment uh, modalities were covered by previous uh, speakers. One is uh, thermal ablation by Dr. Partha Basu and uh, conization by Dr. S.K. Giri. So cryotherapy is again an ablative method which is used for treating cervical precancer. So how uh, uh, thermal ablation works on the principle of using uh, heat, here it works with the principle of destructing the uh, cells using cold injury, which can destroy both normal and neoplastic epithelial cells. Usually nitrous oxide or carbon dioxide gases are used. The temperature drops to minus 60 to minus 80 degrees when the gas is released. And when it is applied onto the uh, cervix, the tissue temperature drops to minus 20 degrees, causing permanent damage to epithelial cells. So the ectocervix has sparse sensory nerve endings, so it doesn't require any anesthesia. So the basic principle of cryotherapy is using a gas to <clears throat> freeze the cells and thereby it causes destruction of the uh, abnormal cells. So after understanding the uh, principle, so most of you, I mean, I, in that matter, most of us are very, very familiar with this cryo unit. And this, not only for uh, cervical pre-cancer, we used to use, we use it even for a huge ectopies, which were described by Dr. Priya Ganesh, when women come with abnormal white discharge. So this is the cryo equipment. Uh, this is the cryo gun with the different types of probes. And this is the end where we are going to connect to the gas cylinder. And this is the pressure gauge and the monitor. So uh, before actually we do this procedure, we need to know for whom we should do this procedure. So eligibility criteria are very, very essential. Then uh, we need to see what is the uh, size and extent and the site of the lesion on the ectocervix. So it should not be, uh, there should not be any extension into the endocervix or onto the vagina. And then the columnar junction should be at the external us or it should be completely visible. So most of the times type 1 TZ and up to some extent type 2, we can do it. Then should not occupy, the lesion should not occupy more than 75% of the cervix. And the size of the probe which we select should be co uh, should cover the tip of the, uh, the entire TZ. So that means the size should be covered by the tip of the largest cryotherapy probe. So if it is not going to, uh, cover the entire lesion, then that means it is not a suitable uh, condition for doing this uh, cryotherapy. We need to go for mostly the uh, excisional procedures. So there should not be any suspicion of invasive cancer on colposcopy or cytology. There should not be any disparity between cytology and colposcopy. There should not be any glandular abnormalities on cytology. <clears throat> so after the criteria are satisfied, then we need to keep the instruments ready, like what Dr. Partha Basu has told us earlier. We need to have a good examination table, gloves, uh, self-retaining cusco speculum, lateral vaginal retractors when needed, then cotton tip swabs, 5% testic acid, lugals, iodine, then good light, then cryotherapy unit, nitrous oxide or carbon dioxide gas cylinders. So all these things have to be uh, kept ready and have to be checked that they are functional. Then before you we start the procedure, we need to explain to the woman, then counsel her, consent her, then expose the cervix using the Casco speculum. We have to visualize the entire TZ. You have to select the correct size probe to cover the entire TZ. Then pressure of the gas cylinder is at 40 to 70 kgs per centimeter square. So the indicator on the monitor, what I'm going to show in the video will be should be in the green zone. The probe is applied firmly on the cervix for a, a good freezing effect. 
So we usually follow the principle of freeze, stop, freeze technique, at least three minutes of freezing, five minutes of thawing, three minutes of um, again refreezing so that the depth of the destruction would be up to seven mm because there could be an extension of CIN into gland crypts. So this is the a small video which I'm going to uh, show now about the equipment. Actually, what I will see is like the subset cylinder. So, the cylinder is in front of me. So, the procedure is very simple. So, after explaining everything to the woman who needs uh, cryotherapy and making her comfortable on the couch with consent and everything. So, before actually you make, uh, make sure that the equipment for the procedure, everything is ready and it is working well. So, here you see this is uh, the Procedure again. We uh, select the probe according to the size of the transformation probe. So, this uh, uh, tip of the probe goes into the cervical pass and, and this entire uh, the probe here, the rounded one, will uh, be in touch with the transformation probe. So, uh, what we need to do is we have to fix this end to the cylinder, the nitrous oxide cylinder. So this is screw will be fitting. Uh, there are two holes on the nitrous oxide and one will fit here. The other one will be into the other hole. And once you open it, this is actually the gas outlet. So once you open it, what happens is you have to make sure that this pointer will raise, indicating that there is nitrous oxide inside. And at least it should be uh, in the green zone to make sure that you have got adequate uh, uh, gas in the uh, cylinder. So once it is set in, and uh, once you have put the probe in contact with the cervical uh, transformation node, you just need to press the trigger like a gun. Then the uh, freezing happens at this. The gas is released and the freezing of the tissue happens. So once the limited time of three minutes is over, you just release it for the thawing and again you press it for release. So this is very simple and very easy to learn, very short learning curve. The only thing is when you are putting inside, make sure that it doesn't touch any tissue other than the cervix. So this is how the cryogram is used for cryogram. This is again a, a small video. Uh, this actually I've taken from my ARC manual. So here the procedure is uh, shown how it is going to be done. So after exposing the cervix, the VIA and the VLE is done. And the cryoprobe is applied onto the cervix, the transformation zone and freezing is uh, happening. You can see that white ice ball uh, forming there. So after sufficient uh, time of application of uh, three minutes, then uh, the once you stop, then the thawing effect happens. Slowly the probe will come out. You should never try to pull out the probe with pressure. You should give sufficient time for it to thaw itself and then uh, the probe will come out. So at the end of the procedure, the appearance would be like this. You will see the entire uh, area getting uh, white in color because of the freezing. So this is uh, the application and this is after the procedure. So coming to the side effects, just similar to the thermal ablation, here also women can complain of a little discomfort or cramping in the lower abdomen during or after the procedure which can be taken care by simple analgesics. We also need to warn them that they have, they can have a watery vaginal discharge for about two to three weeks. So as long as the discharge is minimal and if they don't see any bleeding or smell in the discharge, or if they don't have any uh, fever or uh, severe pain in the lower abdomen, they need not worry. Usually antibiotics are not required. 
and only uh, time we need to consider is if there is any sign of infection. So we have to, uh, before uh, sending them, we need to explain everything about the warning symptoms and the warning signs and when they need to come to hospital. So uh, just like in thermal ablation, we can also call them after uh, four to six weeks just to make sure that they're doing fine. And again, the follow-up of uh, CIN, the response and everything is after one year. So here the complications of stenosis of the cervix are all very, very rare because it's a simple ablative procedure. Uh, only thing again, the warning thing is we should not uh, touch the vaginal walls with the probe during the procedure because it can cause a, uh, a pain. So that the precaution one has to follow. The same thing I've already covered, the post-treatment advice and most important is uh, advising them about abstinence for four to six weeks so that they'll not have any <clears throat> infection or bleeding because the cervix would be very raw in the stage of healing. So I've already covered the warning signs when to come to hospital. Uh, so the cure rates of almost all procedures are uh, similar, but the selection of uh, a case for a particular uh, treatment is very, very important. So cryotherapy has got a cure rate of 85 to 94 percent. So thank you very much for your patient hearing and thank you Bhagya Madam for giving me this opportunity to be part of this uh, uh, Northeast program. Thank you ma'am. It was really useful to understand the tips and tricks of cryo mm -hmm. from you and without any delay I would like to now start the, my presentation on LEAP. So uh, we'll just, I'll cut short and we'll quickly finish this. Just a sec. So I'll be, uh, we have already heard from Dr. Giri sir about the uh, conization. So uh, conization is a process, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a procedure for the uh, excision procedure. We know that uh, the treatment of uh, uh, cervical precancer is both uh, ablation and excision. So for excision, we have two, two, pro two procedures available. One is cone and one is leap. So I'll be talking about the leap. Is my screen visible? I mean, if there is somebody. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, basic principles of LEDs is uh, LEDs or LEAP, they are both the same thing. And uh, it is an excisional method for treatment of CIN. A wire loop electrode, which is powered by an electrosurgical unit, is used to resect the transformation zone along with the lesion. And it actually removes the entire transformation zone, not just the lesion, with adequate length of the endocervix to ensure at least two to three millimeter of disease-free margin and removal of the full depth of the crypts in the transformation zone. The, the, what are the criteria? What are the indications for LEDs? The lesions that are not fulfilling the criteria for ablation. That has already been discussed by Dr. Leela and Dr. Partha. So the CIN1 lesion, which is persisting for more than two years and which is not suitable for cryotherapy, you can go ahead with the LEDs. CIN2 or 3 lesions. And in the screen and treat approach also, this procedure can be used if the patients are VI or HPV positive and they cannot be treated by cryotherapy. The patients with adenocarcinoma in C2 Preferably cold knife conization, but yes, even LEDs can be done. Microinvasive cancer, the patients who had SKH or HCL with a type 3 transformation zone and no visible lesion on colposcopy. Persistent abnormal cytology in the absence of any lesion visible on colposcopy. Cytology or endocervical curatage showing glandular abnormality. So these are the indications for LEDs, the principles. Ideally, we should remove the entire transformation zone as a single piece of tissue, but sometimes it doesn't happen and the lesion is big. In that situation, we can remove the transformation zone in pieces as is shown in this picture. So we have removed the entire transformation zone, but in three bits. But yes, remember the central part should be excised first, followed by the part which are left. 
the principles types of excision depending on the type of transmission zone and length of window surface removed there are three types of excision procedures type 1 type 2 and type 3 type 1 when the lesion is entirely on the ecto surface which is the most frequently done procedure and type 3 actually is when the, the, the lesion is going into endocervical canal and is not visible and then we go ahead and take a top hat so that becomes a type 3 excision and somewhere in between is a type 2 excision so these are the instruments required for the procedure we need an insulated speculum but remember the quality of insulation should be good but it is not mandatory and better is to have a smoke evacuator attached to the speculum uh, otherwise then we need the whole things which are required for doing a colposcopy and also we need one uh, tender cervical curettage we need the the curate and then we need this these are the various different types of ele loop electrodes that are required different sizes and you can choose depending on the size of the lesion we also need a ball electrode these three things are mandatory and this is the endocervical speculum the lateral vaginal wall retractor the lateral vaginal wall retractor is a useful instrument sometimes vaginal walls are you know bulky and they lax and they tend to fall in the field then we may end up having some injury so this instrument helps us to prevent that but yes the usage of this becomes a little troublesome because it causes little pain to the patient and another thing is the spinal needle to introduce to, to instill the local anesthesia in the perilesional area so this is important to see this uh, endocervical, this uh, casco speculum, which is insulated. And these are the, uh, the instruments required for conducting need. And this is our unit, electrosurgical unit. So uh, I have already told you this. And a non otherwise, if you do not have this, this kind of a lateral general wall retractor, and sometimes and usually we use a non-lubricated condom with its end, which is cut off and stretched around the speculum, which also is a very useful thing to hold the vaginal walls away from the field. So this is an integrated electrosurgical unit with smoke evacuator. And we use a blend of cutting and coagulation current. The wattage required varies from machine to machine. Should start at 40 watt coagulation and 40 watt cutting current and gradually increased if necessary. So uh, we can avoid the injury to the vagina at time vagina when we use a cotton tip. I mean, in a sponge on a holder and that is put in the lateral phonics and with a little bit manipulation and we can, you know, kind of achieve our outcome. So direction of this is a this is suppose this is a lesion. This shows that anesthesia, the local anesthesia, the procedure is done under local anesthesia or almost always. Uh, but yes, it is required to five to seven ml of one percent xylocaine with adrenaline needs to be inserted across the lesion throughout. But yes, sometimes regional or general anesthesia may be required. The lesion extends into vagina and exposure is difficult or the patient is not willing for local anesthesia. So this, this picture shows the directions. We can do a leap side to side and upside down also. We, uh, if you're choosing the upside down approach, then in that condition, you have to start from the lower lip, not the upper lip. If you start the upper lip, from the upper lip, there will be bleeding and your field will be obscured when you come down. So this is how we go. And with a sturdy movement, we can go up from below to upwards or up. The, the way your hand is comfortable and this is how we remove the lesion and um, and the crater is seen and which can be coagulated by the electrode ball electrode so uh, this is the thing and then this is side to side which shows that uh, we can depending on our direction from right to left or left to right if it's, it's entirely your choice you can pick up and gradually you go uh, within the substance of the cervix across the lesion and we can remove this lesion and this is a crater which can be coagulated. This is just one video which, where we, we will see that uh, this uh, the, the, the spinal needle or sometimes even the dental syringe can be used to instill the lignocaine with the adrenaline 5 to 7, 7 ml across, uh, all around the lesion and uh, As usually what, what we do is as are applied in cold knife conization, we also give this three and nine o'clock sutures in both the directions. And this helps us to you know, reduce the bleeding. And also at times we can use it for traction also. And this is a smoke evacuator, which is attached with the cascose speculum if it is available. But yes, it is not always available. But then it, if it is available, it helps us to evacuate the smoke and make our fields clear. 
now uh, after once it is the field is clear now we use we take up the the required size electrode and then we do a phantom application to, to direct us to decide which direction we are, our hand is going to move and then we switch on the current i mean once we apply it and then we will now use the cord tree as i've already told 40 to 50 watts blending current and then we put it uh, at one end and then gradually they get there but remember the direction has to be like movement has to be sturdy and you know you put it and then you switch on the current and then yeah this is how it is to go and with a smooth smooth flow but this should be neither be too fast nor be too slow if it's too fast then there will be a lot of bleeding if it's too slow it will lead to a lot of chairing so it has to be very sturdy and very or optimum kind of a speed and then gradually you stop it and then you take it out with the help of a forceps and then the crater is there where you see the small bleeders are there, especially towards the margins, towards the edge, and then these bleeders, but then they are very easily coagulated with the help of a ball electrode. Sometimes you spray mode for that, and then we cauterize the whole crater. This is the, you can apply the monocyl solution also sometimes, and this is how it looks like. And then this, this slight bleeding is coming and then this also can be coagulated. So that's it. And uh, this is another video which shows that uh, this is also from IR Catalyst. This basically shows a large lesion which was there. And then again, after installation of this uh, xylocaine with adrenaline solution across this lesion, the large size loop is cho chosen for the uh, excision and uh, this this picture will sh this figure this video shows you how you know can use this large size loop. So this is the installation of the local anesthesia. Now this is a large size loop and a, you know a little, little bit cumbersome, but the lesion is so large that you have to use this big size loop. And but then be careful because you know it should not you know doesn't get stuck. So it, it might get stuck within the substance of the cervix, and then gradually you can bring it out so this is we can do a large um, leap as well and so this is it and sometimes you know if it is a type 3 transformation zone it was seen here then in that condition you can take a top hat you can use a, a square square kind of an electrode uh, and then that that uh, square kind square hat we can take and it can be applied now and yeah like this this is a square electrode and then you can take a top hat from this so that there is a type 3 transformation zone, type 3 excision. So this is this is how we remove it. And now this is a, basically you remove the entire transformation zone in the type 3, in the entire transformation zone, even if it was type 3 transformation zone. There's a type 3 excision, which is possible using leap. But yes, even cold knife organization can also be given done for these patients. And then this is a ball cautery, which is used for coagulation of bleeding points. So complications, as have already been discussed, hemorrhage, primary and secondary, both discharge, excessive discharge, the management remains the same. Yes, PID may be exaggerated, ex exacerbated. Cervical stenosis and preterm prom and preterm labor can be can happen in early Paris patients. So be careful when you do this leap in this ER or any, any kind of excisional procedure in young patients who are desirous of pregnancy. The indication should be clear that yes, it should be a persistent lesion. You should otherwise not like not like the, like the patients who have already completed it. it should be persisting for more than high grade lesion should be persisting for more than one year or low grade lesion may be persisting for more than two years and then only we should be careful then when we excise the transformation zone in these younger patients the management of primary hemorrhage in cases with congested and hypertrophic cervix patients might bleed on the table uh, especially the large the transformation zone is too large or the lesion is extending too far laterally or if we move too quickly and or if we interrupt the excision midway or maybe you know sometimes we injure the lateral wall so uh, post treatment advice and follow up can is exactly like same we don't advise any antibiotics because benefit is not proven and if there is any invasion and positive margin this pathology should always be sent and should always be followed and cin23 or 
microinvasive cancer or glandular disease on the inner margin, then we have to either repeat the LEDs or maybe we may give the option of hysterectomy to the patient. So, um, so those who have a persistent disease at first follow-up after 12 months, repeat excision may be done to rule out invasive cancer. The follow-up immediate after one month with HP report, follow-up procedures are 6 to 12 months. We can do HPV testing that is called the test of cure. Usually WHO now recommends it to be done after 12 months. But uh, yes, even other options like pap smear, VI, VLA, whatever is available, we can do. But yes, HPV test is most useful. And depending on this positivity, we can decide if we go ahead with a colposcopy or repeat excision. So with this, I would like to finish my talk. And if there are any questions, we'll be happy to answer. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. So now I would like to conclude this session for the day. It was a very, very useful uh, webinar. And I'm grateful to Foxy who gave us this opportunity to all of us and to our and to Dr. Alpesh Gandhi, Dr. Rishikesh Pai and our chief guest, Dr. Usha Sariya, Madam, and to all of our faculty who participated in this session and who were actually useful to make it so much informative for all of us and for a happy learning for all of us. So, and I'm also thankful to all the delegates who attended this and I'm sure they'll be benefited for their daily to day, -to -day practice. And th thank you, Dr. Bhagya ma'am, for giving us this wonderful opportunity on behalf of all the faculty who participated. We would, be, we would like to express our sincere thanks to you. And with this, I will conclude this webinar. Thank you, Leela, ma'am, for st staying till the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I always like to listen and learn from others. <laughs> thank you. That's really modest to be. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Yeah, so we look, we, we look forward to see you again in some other <laughs> webinar. Yeah.